Uh, so let's uh, officially start the European uh, session of the 2023 FUSENET Teacher Day. So it is a pleasure for us to have you here attending. And um, well, to, to start with the program, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Rodivan. So Rodivan is a lecturer at the University of York, and he is also the chair of the FUSENET Board of Governors. And he will give you the opening uh, introduction to this uh, to this session today. So please, Roddy, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dario. Um, welcome, everyone, very much to this to this uh, teach day. Dario, how many of these have we done now? It feels like we've done quite a, quite a few now. This is now a regular event in the in the FuseNet calendar. Wh which one's this, Dario? This is the fourth, the fourth, fourth one. Yeah. So it, it's really great that this is now now a regular thing. So perhaps perhaps I should say, please encourage your colleagues if they're not able to come to the, this year, please please um, encourage them to come along. Uh, next year. As Dario indicated, I'm, I'm chair of the Board of Governors of FuseNet, so I'm one of the academics across Europe that, that helps FuseNet hopefully run smoothly, though, although of course it's Dario and Mira and the rest of the, the folk in the executive office who actually make everything really happen. Uh, FuseNet is an uh, association that covers the whole of, of Europe, well, and we have members in, in 23 countries, so the, the vast majority of, of countries in Europe, um, and our members cross universities and research institutes, so national labs and, and industry members as well. Our vision is that everyone in, in Europe gets access to the fusion information, education and training um, that they need, appropriate for their, their role in society. I think I've got sort of two, two or three messages, really. The first and by far the most important is thank you so much for giving up your time to come to this, this event today. You as teachers are the engine room that, that um, educate our population. Um, and without you, we, we, we don't have anything, right? So, so thank you so much for, for all the work that you do and giving up your extremely valuable time to come along today. Um, please don't let today be the end of your association with with fusion so please do ask questions in in and i know the domestic sessions are sort of going on through the day um it's great that you've engaged with those already um please do ask questions of your your um domestic hosts um do please send questions to fuse as well i'm sure that dario can probably magically put up an email address somewhere too so do please just contact the, the fusenet central office as well the other thing is through the day, please do be critical friends to us. That was my that was going to be my next point. So if we 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 want to do our very best to support you in the in uh, the the um, education of fusion and the, and the education of the next generation of, of fusion leaders, engineers, scientists. If there are things that we are not, we're, we're quite proud of what we've done so far, and and. Um, uh, uh, had it, a few years ago, we weren't really doing anything in, in this sector, in the school sector, in this college sector. So um, we're quite proud of what we've done already. But if there are other things that we could do that would support you, please do tell us, right? The worst thing that happens is we say, sorry, we can't do that. But, it, but what would be really bad is if the stuff that we can do, which we're not doing simply because we don't know about it. So please do tell us what we can do as a, as a cross European organization to support you, um, that would be that would be really helpful. Um, and um, the uh, final thing I was going to say actually is just to emphasise what you're probably already picking up, but I don't think there's any harm to, to say this again. That fusion is at such an exciting stage. I've been lucky enough to be involved with fusion for uh, twenty years or so, a bit longer than that. The reason I, and perhaps it's worth saying, the reason that I ended up doing fusion rather than anything else is because of an inspirational school teacher. I got to go to my national lab on a school trip. Had it not been for that, I certainly wouldn't have been working in fusion. I'm so glad that that school trip happened. I'm so glad I ended up working in fusion. Um, and um, but for quite a long time, fusion has been at the stage where it's always several decades away and it's been something of an academic, frankly, something of an academic endeavor. 
What's really exciting about Web Fusion is at the moment, both in Europe and globally, is that we're now entering a uh, an era where we're really talking about what we need to do to build fusion power plants. Uh, we are now regularly um, a, a good proportion of the of the work that I'm now doing is sure is still thinking about the fundamental science and that will continue to be critical, but also thinking much more practically about how do we put a power plant together? How much is it going to cost? How do we make sure that it's popular amongst the general public? How do we make sure it's the uh, it's got sufficient efficiency? How do we integrate it with the rest of the grid? So as fusion enters this power plant era, sure, we've got some technical challenges to overcome and, and those are really important. But perhaps the biggest challenge that Fusion faces is training sufficient people to, to, um, to fill all the roles that will arise, both in core Fusion science and engineering and also in, in adjacent sectors. Without you, we simply can't do this. So perhaps I finish where I started and say thank you so much for, for being here. It's great that, that you're here and, and educating all our, our bright young people. Um, and please don't let let this be your your final interaction with with fusion as it were please stay stay in touch with us and and yeah let us know how else we can support you um dario that's what i was going to say um should i say anything about the the program well, we've, got, you... we've got an exciting program on this afternoon haven't we so we've got the the classroom materials coming up in just a minute or two so these are some of the the materials that we've already prepared over the over the last few years and yeah we'd love to get your feedback we'd love you to use these materials but we'd we'd love to get you your feedback on on how could they be better what could be improved and so forth um we've then got a virtual tour of, of jet the joint european tourist down in oxfordshire which you'll have seen earlier this year has got some um uh, record breaking performance and it's going through another deuterium tritium campaign so not only is it the um, so it's uh, not it's only the second tokamak in the world that is run with deuterium and tritium, um, but it's also still operating. So this is really exciting. Um, and then we also have a visit to ETA, which is the, the biggest terrestrial science experiment ever built in the south of France, which is just just so. Um, yeah, which is just so cool. Um, if you get the opportunity, try and get yourself to ETA. The engineering and the science is just mind blowing. So. I'm really pleased we've got this exciting program for you for you as well. Um, Dario, that's, I think, what I was going to say. Um, is there anything that I haven't said that I should have said? No, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> thank you so much, Roddy, for the introduction. I think that like totally agree with what you say, and, and thank you for, for opening this this session for us. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll try to keep the interest going through the event, and hopefully after the event, which is most important, that that interest is transmitted to the students and we can continue to, to form people in Fusion for the, for the next years to come. That's brilliant. Thank you, Dario. All right. So yes, like Roddy said, uh, we will continue with our program. So, but before we start with the with the classroom materials, I would like to let you know a little bit how the session is going to work. Because as you can see, the the Zoom uh, format that we're using here is in the form of a webinar. So the way you can interact with us, and I hope that you have many questions during the event, is that as you can see in the down panel, you will you have a Q and A uh, box. So if you have any questions that arise up during the, the presentations, uh, please write them there. and uh, We will, uh, we will uh, read them out loud, but also the, the speakers were able to, to see them and they will try to solve as many as possible. If we see that there are many questions that cannot be unsolved, we will save these questions. We will send them to the speakers. And then afterwards, we will email uh, back to you when, uh, yeah, we will send you some emails after the event. And we will include uh, answers to those questions in, in, that, uh, in that email. So yeah, for any interactions you want to have with us, any questions, we'll try to answer as many as possible during today's session. Uh, so yeah, please ask the Q&A panel uh, for today. Okay, so I guess it's turn to do my presentation. Let me share my screen. I hope you're seeing full, yes, full screen. Very good. 
So, um, yeah, again, uh, welcome to the event. <laughs> so I would like to, to talk to you about the, our educational initiatives. So I have a, prem a premise to make. I know some of you, uh, some of the assistants have already attended uh, our previous events, and also some of you have attended the previous uh, ITER visits that we're going to hear about later during the program today. So maybe some of you are familiar with this content. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to uh, invite you to, to anyway stay here and see what the models are about, because also we're going to discuss about the status of the model translations, which we have mentioned before, and we're going to give you an update of what is going on. Uh, but uh, I'm doing this presentation again because we have new teachers involved in this event, so I would really like them to be aware, like you were aware in the previous events, of the educational materials uh, that we have available for you to use the, during your lessons. So yes, but saying that, let me show you what we're going to see today in my presentation. So we're going to give an overview of the fusion, uh, fusion educational modules. Then we're going to give you a short summary of the status of the translation of the different models into the different uh, languages. And then I'm going to mention uh, the Fusion Educational video that is also, uh, its main purpose is to be used at secondary school education and that it is already available uh, in our YouTube channel. And what we hope you will get today is that the knowledge that you have already some lessons uh, prepared for you, that you can uh, implement them in the classroom and you can uh, teach uh, students about fusion with already existing materials that will help you in this task. And yeah, and that's pretty much the idea that you, you, you uh, finish this presentation with the knowledge of the tools that you have available from, from Fusionet. So let's talk about the modules. So we have classroom materials, and this is a set of modules that it has been uh, developed by Fusionet. So we develop a set of five modules covering uh, many topics of nuclear fusion. Uh, you can see the uh, you can see them there listed uh, the cover page. So uh, fusion basics, road to fusion, plasma control, fusion materials, and deployment. So we try to cover as uh, much topic as possible, always keeping in mind that this is for secondary school education. So trying to keep it engaging, interesting uh, with with scientific content, but also uh, at the level of secondary school education. So the modules. Um, like, uh, like like their own name says, they're modular in nature. So it means that uh, we have, for example, the model number one is uh, the fusion basics module. So this is the model that introduces the whole concept of fusion and it is the starting module. So in order to use these models, this is the base. This is the one we start everything with. But then the other modules are designed in a way that you can uh, use them independently. So you, you, if you want to discuss module number five, you don't have to go through all the previous models. You just use module number one as the introduction. And then if you want to talk about deployment or fusion materials or plasma control, or you can use them in any way you want. Uh, so we, we try to make it as flexible as possible because we understand that perhaps uh, it's not for you, it's not uh, interesting to show everything, but just a few topics that will engage the interest of the students. So we leave that uh, that freedom to you, and we design these modules in such a way that you can uh, choose uh, you can choose how to follow. You start at model number one, and then the rest is up to you and the needs you see uh, within your your classroom. Then we have the the setup of each module. So what I mean by models is that each module consists of a student reader. Uh, some presentation slides, which are available for you in PPT and PDF format. There is a teacher manual and there are additional exercises. The models are already available on the Fusionet website. So you go to our website, fusionet.eu. You go to the education uh, uh, panel. You look for educational materials. And then uh, after that, you get immediately sent to our page. So we have a page called educational materials, which encompasses a lot of uh, let's say research material or, or, or papers or books that resources that are uh, useful for, for students, but we give priority to our, to our uh, modules. So you can find them at the very top of the page. And then if you click on any of the models, for example, let's say model number one, you will find, first of all, the model information. So little summary of how it is organized, what it's gonna be discussing, which topics. And then on the side panel, First, you will have the possibility to download the PowerPoint slides. 
And then uh, you will have the possibility to download uh, the rest of the documents in PDF. That meant the, the student reader, the additional exercises, the teacher manual, and even the slides on PDF, but the PowerPoint slides are on the, on the panel above. So now we're gonna discuss a little bit of uh, how are the modules, uh, yeah, how, how they look like. So what's the content overview and, and a visual preview. I'm not gonna go through all the modules. I'm just gonna focus a little bit on model number one. And then because the, the scheme is the same for all of them. So, so model number one is Fusion Basics. Let's say that for, for example, the student reader it's a total of 40 pages and it is divided in five chapters. Energy and its role in our world, fusion inside of our sun, then we move to plasma, building a, a fusion device, and then some further reading. So like I said, this is the, the start of everything. We try here to give uh, an overview of all the basics and, and make uh, like a, a foundation uh, in order uh, for you to discuss the later modules on. So this is how it looks, for example, a piece of the student reader then we have uh, a preview of the presentation. So this is how the how the slides look like. So we try to make it as visual as possible. And then of course the slides, you are free to adapt to your preferences. So you don't have also to do the slides in order. If you find a different way to present the topic to your students, feel free to use them uh, as you wish. So we uh, that's they're also designed in a way that you have the freedom how to use the, those lights. You don't have to go through the whole set. Then, uh, for example, uh, we have now the, the teacher manual. So what we, uh, the idea behind the teacher manual is to, to give you the learning objectives, the topics per chapter, a summary, some lesson schemes and uh, li uh, additional links. So this is like, yeah, like a teacher manual for, for, a, for a fusion or a science book would look like. So we give you additional information. So just to show you, this is divided, for example, the model number one, the different chapters, some basic concepts like what it's talking about. And then we give you a proposal for what you could do during your uh, your lessons. So this is like a scheme we propose to you. We say, okay, for example, if you have a 15 minute introductory lesson. How can you use this module? How can you uh, optimize the tools you have. Well, of course, this is a suggestion. At the end, you are the ones who know how to better organize your, your class, but uh, maybe it would be easier if you already have a starting uh, position, a starting idea schema, and then you can build on that and you can adapt it to your own preferences. So all that is included in the in the teacher manual. Um, yeah. Then we have uh, exercises, so additional exercises. Sorry, I went too fast. So there is additional exercise if you want to give additional, uh, yeah, a homework or you want to go further on a topic, you have the additional exercises and you will have the, the, the solution within, the, within the, the set of modules as well. So this is pretty much it. So the full module contains student reader, teacher manual, additional exercises and presentation slides. So this is a summary of uh, module number one. Module number two is the same. I'm just gonna uh, enumerate the different topics so for example, mode number two is more on history. So how is the discovery of fusion? How were the first devices? The concepts of breakthrough and breakdown, ether of course, and then yeah, additional reading like the, or like the other modules. Model number three is more focused on plasma. So we start talking more about the plasma itself. What's the introduction to plasma control? How do you hit the plasma? How do you measure the plasma temperature? And we reach conclusions and further reading like the, like the other modules. Model number four is fusion materials. So this is a this is a module close to my heart because I, I, I used to work on that on material for fusion, and it's really important because that uh, we discuss the topic of uh, what to do, how to work with materials for the extreme conditions that uh, are required to make a fusion. So we have the heat exhaust problem, uh, neutron irradiation. We're going to discuss about the breathing blanket. So all these concepts are, are mentioned here. And then the last module is something um, to discuss beyond. So this is based on the idea that we already have fusion. So we have already a, a working device. Now what? Now what's the next step? How we're gonna, how it's gonna be fusion implemented within the grid into the energy, let's say environment. So here is this cost, what is fusion power? What is the demand and supply? How can fusion be part of the energy mix? What about the money? <laughs> How, what are gonna be the costs of fusion in the future? 
and how, how can it be cheaper and what's the next step so there is ether at the moment but of course there has to be next steps so this is this is what is being discussed in this module so now translations yes the first time we proposed these models, uh, we had really good feedback from you and your colleagues from the, the previous editions. You say, yeah, this is really good. The models are useful. But of course, we would like to have them in our own language because it's easier to, to teach in your own language, especially in high school. So we started this project and we are grateful that we found voluntary translators. And that includes many of you and your colleagues uh, who, who decided to to translate these materials into your own languages. So of course, if you are interested in, in creating, in helping us with the translation, you can send us an email to, to, to at fio at fusenet.eu. So that's our account. And then let us know if you're interested in helping us with the materials. But I want to let you know how is the um, progress in these translations. So this is, as, this is of August, 2023. This is the status of our model translations. So the translation for the models are, uh, let's say uh, they, they have four steps. So first of all, you, we get the translation from the, from the translators. Then the second step is we find um, as a researcher uh, that proofread this translation. So we, we make sure that the, that the wording and the terminology is okay. So we make sure that it's proofread. Then after that, we process the, the model in the sense that we make it visually as similar as the English version. And then the last step is, of course, making it available to the site. So you can see in this grid, the languages we have so far and the status of the different models. So, so far we have uh, available in the site, the translation of module number one, Italian and Danish. And I have to say that the, the Italian versions are doing a great job because we have work already on the five models. So at different stages, but we have translators working on the five models already. And soon model number three and number four will be available on the site. Uh, the Dutch module is being uh, proofread. So yeah, you can see the, the different status here. So we are moving forward. And so we are really grateful to the translators that help us in this task. Uh, and yeah, and we encourage you to, to work on this. I have to tell you something that we are discussing about using artificial intelligence for translation because there are new tools available. So we will, we will look into that. But for the moment, before the artificial intelligence replaces us all, we are really happy to have you helping us with the translation. So and we're going to give you a heads up on the status of this project of, of translating using, using AI. Um, yeah, so this is the, and if you don't find your language here, it means that at the moment, no translations are being done. We are open to that. So if you're interested uh, in helping us with that, please let us know or, or disseminate this information with your colleagues uh, for, for, for them to reach us and, and help us with this. Yes, I'll come on to the, to the last uh, part of my presentation. So there is the, the video. So we released this video uh, yeah, a couple of years ago. This is a, a video about fusion for, let's say for the secondary school level that we produced uh, with the help of a UK-based uh, company that specializes in this kind of filming. So they had previous works with ITER uh, and then they already, uh, they know how, how Fusion works. So we, we, we had a project with them and we, the outcome was a 30 minute video on Fusion. So of course you don't have to use the whole video, but if you find something useful of it that you can use it in the classroom, then uh, yeah, let us know and, uh, and use it and, and adapt it to your preferences. So I'm just gonna give you two small previews of how the video looks like. I hope the sound is working, let's see. Hydrogen is isotopes are deuterium with one proton and one neutron and tritium with one proton and two neutrons. So they collide with a very high energy and temperature around 150 million degrees, which is 10 times higher temperature than in the center of the sun. And they can fuse. So we have helium element and we have one neutron. So this is the most important part of the reaction because neutron takes 80% energy of the fusion reaction. It turns out we need strong magnetic fields. 
So we actually need uh, two types of magnetic field. Uh, the first one happens in what we call the toroidal direction. This is following the shape of the torus around. But that wouldn't be quite enough to keep it completely confined. So what we do is we actually want a magnetic field as well in what we call the poloidal direction. And that sort of introduces a twist. Yeah, so this is the video, just a short, uh, short reels of what it looks like, and you can find it in this link. But of course, after the event, we will send you the, the link to the event, but it's already to the video, sorry, and but it's already available in our YouTube channel. So there is a Fusion at YouTube channel, and you can find there the video itself. Hydrogen is isotopes, a uh, deuterium. Let's see. Yes. So yeah, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, like I said at the beginning, what the idea behind this is that you had an overview of the educational modules, you had a preview of the educational video, and we would like to invite you, of course, to join our initiative of the teacher day, the next the next event. We are really happy that you are following up FUSENET on the different stages. So we're happy that you're attending several uh, teacher days, and we would like to continue, we would like you to continue doing this, and we hope to expand our network of teachers, because like Roddy said at the beginning, we consider you very valuable because you are the ones who are forming the, the, the future fusion workers because you know the timeline of fusion is a, it's a, a one that goes uh, to through a lot of time and then we need to prepare uh, students and, and workers in advance. So I think that's it from my side. I'm gonna stop sharing. And yeah, and then I'm gonna give room to the next Sorry? Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna see, oh, there are some, there are some questions in the, in the chat. So people ask me, do we have students day? Yeah, that's a really good question. So this is, at the moment we don't have for, for uh, let's say for um, secondary school students. We do organize, um, events for students at the master level and at the PhD level. So this is more this is more um, advanced. So they are already into fusion. But of course, we are a, a student oriented association. So part of our activities and something that we would like to expand is also start to contact the students in a young from a younger phase. So now we're moving towards bachelor. So we're starting uh, we are planning to start something some events at bachelor, but then we would like to to also start making something for the for the students uh, at a at a secondary school level. I think that's useful. I think at that also at that uh, age, if you make activities, you are more receptive. I believe that if you see something applied, if you are involved in in fusion at that at that age, you are very receptive, and then uh, yeah, you can get a lot of of, of uh, good things from from that. Uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, if you have ideas of activities locally, please let us know. Maybe we can work together. So if you say, oh, I would like to organize something. I would like to perhaps bring the student to something or try to see if the students, if I can go to the students to somewhere, that's, that's useful. I know that there are some teachers uh, that organize visits uh, with the students to ITER. For example, I can I always mention ITER because they are they are always uh, looking forward to get to get students and visits and and get involved with with the local community. So yeah, this is my answer to you. Contact us if you have ideas. But it is true that we are looking forward to to expanding our activities towards students, uh, not only at master and PhD, but to a different level. Um, yeah, and with that, I will give room to Julie and continue with the program. So I guess I will stop my sharing. Yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh, Julie. So let me introduce Julie. Julie is going to be our guide today for the, <laughs> she's working for the UKEA uh, in the UK, and then she will be our, our lead today for the introduction to JET and the virtual visit to JET today. So thank you, Julie, for being here. Um, I will say hello. I'm Julie. I work at the UK AEA, so that's the UK Atomic Energy Authority. Um, and we have some really cool experiments and things going on here. So we have the massive, the massive European machine called JET, Joint European Taurus. And we also have our own smaller machine called MAST-U. Uh, both of these machines use very similar methods um, to do fusion. Um, and we're going to talk more about this 
Um, hopefully, is this going to open? Is, is, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it's doing. Hey, behind me are the doors to what I believe is the most exciting place on site because this is the control room where we actually control the pulses that the jet machine makes. Uh, there's a bit of activity inside today because we're currently running with deuterium deuterium. So let's go inside and have a look around. Doors open. So behind me are the desks where usually the scientists who visit the site will come and sit. So we have experimental groups from all around the world that will come to visit us here if they have a particular project that they want to run inside of the jet machine. On the other side of the room is where the UK AEA engineers and scientists on site tend to sit who are in control of the jet pulses while they take place. So we'll have a look around and I'll point out some of the key people who are the most important while we're running jet. There's a few balloons around. We actually celebrated Jet's 40th birthday last week. I had the privilege of being part of the photos that we took on site, which was really exciting. Um, so up on the projector screen behind me is just some of the details of the jet pulses that we're running at the moment. A few people busily talking about what they can see that's happening. <laughs> And we have uh, some videos of the most recent jet pulses that have been fired. So they play on a loop while, uh, while jet is running and people very uh, precisely observing what takes place during a pulse. Uh, further around, we have the engineer in charge. Um, so I work in a different control room across the road and we have a camera that is directed at the back of this guy's head. So most of my day is spent looking at him. Um, in the background you might hear a bit of noise that's um, a voice recording that they have playing while they're running the jet pulses. They play their countdown to the pulse each time. Um, and some of that is played on our live Kodas screens as well so we can see the countdown while all of the different machines that are involved in a jet pulse are getting ramped up to full power ready to pulse. Um, so more of the engineering teams, <laughs> there's lots of different parts that make up jet so we have a lot of um, different groups involved in getting the pulses ready to happen, uh, people who are in control of the different vacuum systems. We have the neutral beams which are used for heating up the plasma inside of jet while we have pulses. Uh, I believe that uh, this is where our shift tech sits, so he's actually the guy who monitors all of the different teams making sure they're all ready to start a jet pulse and he will have the privilege of pressing the start button for the pulse to go each time. Um, over at the back we have the desk, it looks a bit more like the control desk of a spaceship. Um, this is where our incident response officer will sit. So we have to have somebody on site 24-7 who can attend any, um, any incidents that occur, any different alarms that we might get. So if there were a fire alarm somewhere on site, he will have to be off running to check out the area, make sure everyone is safe. You can see there's no one manning the desk at the moment, so maybe he's already gone to check out some excitement that we have today. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this desk, I believe, is the green telephone. So this is a direct hotline that we have to the national grid. When we run a pulse on jet, 
we take between one and two percent of the UK's power to run that pulse. So we have to pick up the phone to the national grid and make sure that we're going to have enough power to run the pulse and that we can take that energy from the grid. So if we call up the national grid and it's the half time of a World Cup football match and everyone's going to boil their kettles, they're probably going to tell us no, you've got to wait. Uh, but today we seem to have a good run, lots of pulses happening, so um, yeah, they're not causing us too much trouble. You can actually, in the background, we've just had a pulse go on right now, so we can see if we can watch it live with everybody else uh, i would expect it's going to come up visually on the screen in the back left actually my first time being live in the jet control room where that happened so quite exciting to be part of a moment like that uh, I've spent many a time in the control room across the road where we fuel jet we also have a video that shows us the pulses uh, and I was actually there when the pulse number counted up to 100,000 so that was quite a special moment to be a part of as well um, so <laughs> It seems like today there is a lot of activity going on inside of the jet control room. Uh, hopefully you have a good idea of the different teams that we have around. Uh, one of the guys from the heating systems, I believe, so inside jet, you should have been told by Nia that we use different combinations of heating systems, one of which is radio frequency and this is where the team that are in control of that heating, that's where they would sit. Uh, the other interesting team to point out is the pirate flag. So I mentioned at the IRO's desk that we have to call up the national grid to make sure we can use the, the energy before we do a pulse. This is where our power supplies team sit. So they're labeled as pirates because they're the ones who steal the power. Um, so that's a nice overview of the control room. Thank you very much. I will leave them to the rest of their pulses. Okay, so that was Rianne and Rianne was showing us inside the control room. So now I can tell you a bit about what is going on when Rianne was showing us the control room. Okay, so. We are not, uh, yeah, no, we are. Excellent. Do we have a PowerPoint? Yes, we have a PowerPoint. Fantastic. Okay, so this is the beginning of the slideshow. Um, will Fusion be powering the future? Well, us folk at UKEA certainly hope so, but we are somewhat biased on that issue. So why is Fusion a good thing? Well, we believe that there is going to be little or no environmental impact. So this is where once you've built your power station, which will require a fair amount of energy and resources to get all the materials to build it, um, those sorts of things. But the reaction itself, the fusion reaction, there is no carbon involved in it. There are no NOx gases released. There's no carbon dioxide. There's no methane, which means fusion will not have those kinds of environmental impacts. So once your, um, your power station is set up, that's it. We've finished making an environmental impact, um, only good stuff from then on. Uh, we don't have any long lived radioactive waste. So unlike um, nuclear stuff, um, our radio, we don't, we don't actually have any radioactive waste. So when we are having our, when we run our plants, when we have our experiments running, um, the inside of the machine becomes what they call activated. So it is exposed to radiation and therefore it can become radioactive. So yes, this is radioactive. However, it is an incredibly short period of time relative to uh, nuclear type uh, radioactive waste. Um, it has a half life of 12 years. So in about hundred years, there is 0.5% 
of the amount of radioactivity. And the radioactivity we're starting with is a much, much lower level than nuclear as well. So radioactive waste is, it does exist, but it is not particularly a problem. And also we're working on many, many different directions of addressing it as well. So not really a problem, we, we would consider it. Um, do we have any risk of critical safety events? No. Fusion is a difficult thing to make happen. It requires a lot of energy and a lot of effort to make it happen. And therefore, if something is, you know, if, if you want to turn the thing off, you essentially just stop powering it. You can get it to go from active to everything's fine fairly quickly. Um, it does not escalate. It cannot escalate due to the nature of the reaction itself. So there you go. No risk of critical safety events in fusion. Fuels are abundant. What fuels do we use? One of the fuels is deuterium. Deuterium is freely available in seawater. One in every 6,000 water molecules is a deuterium, which means it's hydrogen, is a heavy hydrogen, so it has an extra nucleus, an extra neutron on it. Regular hydrogen has just the proton. Um, deuterium has the proton plus um, a neutron. We will get to the other fuel later on. Um, so in fusion, what is fusion actually itself? So what we're doing in fusion is we are smashing two light nuclei together uh, very hard, and they will produce a larger nucleus and a neutron. So if you can see my mouse, you can see that we're smashing the tritium and the deuterium together, forming a blurry thing in the middle, which is extremely short-lived. And then we generate helium and a very, very, very speedy neutron. So we have little scales here, because if you were to put your deuterium and your tritium on the left hand side and helium and the neutron on the right hand side, they would not balance. That's a very interesting thing. It is a very interesting thing and it doesn't entirely make sense. But then you come to possibly the shortest, most beautiful equation that there is e equals mc squared. And the E is for energy, M is for mass and C is the speed of light. Speed of light is very, very fast. Speed of light times itself is an incredibly, incredibly large number. So if you have a very, very, very large number and you multiply it by the tiny, tiny difference in mass between the left-hand side and the right side of our equation, reaction, um, you end up with a substantial number. And that substantial number is the amount of energy that we obtain from this reaction. I will also point out that the reason that we use deuterium and tritium in our experiments is because this is the most efficient reaction that you can do. Um, you get the most energy out of it. Um, there you go. So uh, fusion is, is really hard. It's, it's quite difficult, um, really quite difficult. So here we have a beautiful image of the sun. Fusion is what's happening in the sun all the time. So in the sun, it's very hot. It's, you know, it's very far away, it's very heavy, um, and it's very bright. So the brightness and the heat that we receive um, are the kind of energy that is emitted from a fusion reaction. Um, and we are not crisps, we're not burned into a crisp because we're very far away from it. Um, if we are going to have a small sun on Earth, we will need to figure out a different way to stop us from burning up. So we need to put it in a box. We need to figure out a way to make a sun and also a box to put the sun in that doesn't, you know, it's got to, it's got to contain the sun, which is quite difficult. That is, you know, it's quite difficult. And yeah. So as I've said on the slides, the center of the sun is 15 million degrees, which is very hot. We do not do our experiments at 15 million degrees. We do it at 150 million degrees. So the sun is very hot, it's very big, it's very heavy. When we have our experiments here, we do not have the amount of mass, the amount of weight, the amount of pressure that there is inside the sun. So in order to combat this lack of significant pressure, we have to run our experiments much, much hotter. So that's why there's a discrepancy between the sun's temperature and air temperature. But what we are doing is we are essentially creating our own little sun. We have a diagram talking about the states of matter. 
So I'm sure you all know this. We have solids, we have liquids, we have gases. You add heat to get it to turn from solid into a liquid. You add more heat to get it to turn from a liquid into a gas. But then if you make something really, really hot, really, really, really hot, you will eventually turn it into a plasma. Now a plasma is some, for some reason referred to as a soup. Don't quite understand, but it is referred to as a soup. Um, but what has happened is that our particles that are quite happily existing as atoms in the other particles um, are ripped apart so that they're, the nucleus with the positive charge is floating about in one direction and the electrons are floating about separately from the rest of what should be an atom, wear it together. Which means our soup, our plasma is charged. Now this is important, it is important. Another reason that fusion is really hard is that our nuclei are charged, but they're all charged in the same direction. And if you've ever tried to put your magnets together, north to north or south to south, you will know that you cannot put the positives together or the negatives together because it doesn't want to go. So in order to overcome this reluctance, this significant reluctance, this repelling force, you have to make it go very, very, very fast. Again, this is why we make it 150 million degrees. We're making it incredibly fast. So they smash into each other and then they turn into something else, they do fusion. Okay, so this is our tokamak. It is a diagram of our tokamak. The pink part in the middle is our plasma. Plasma is actually pink if you use hydrogen. Um, if you use other things, it will be different colors, but we use hydrogen, so it is pink. Um, what you can see is the blue part is a magnet. There's lots of magnets going all the way around. These magnets make it go round the donut. Then you've got other sets of magnets that go round this way that make it go round the donut in a squirrely like this. And then the uh, combination makes it go in a helix, which is very nice. So it goes in a little helix. Um, but yes, the reason, yes, we do it in a donut shape because this allows us to use it, uh, to use our magnets to control it. And what allows us to use magnets to control it is the fact that our plasma is charged. So because it's charged, we can use magnets to interfere with that magnetic field that the particles have, and we can get it to go where we want it to do. So that is how we build the box to contain our sun, is we use magnets, electromagnets, to, make, to build our box, which is quite exciting. As Rianne mentioned, we have ohmic heating. So ohmic heating, no, she didn't, she, she mentioned radio frequency. So ohmic heating is when you have an old fashioned light bulb with a little wire in it. Um, that's heating from resistance. So that is one of the ways um, that we get it to heat up. Um, that's a very simple electrical thing. You put resistance in it, same as in a wire, you have resistance and it heats up. The second method is radio frequency heating that, or microwave heating. It's just different parts in the same spectrum. You're microwaving the plasma, like literally. Um, and our neutral beam injection is like um, when you've got your little cue and you, you hit the little pool ball and it bumps into all the other pool balls. Well, the one that you hit first that makes the other ones go fast, that's the neutral beam. So you're firing in fast particles that bump into all the other particles and make all the other particles go faster as well. We have, as we mentioned, it's quite hard. It is quite hard. So we have the first thing that we're going to do, that we have discussed is the plasma science. Plasma is really hard to get because it's really hot. We have done an incredibly limited amount of research, humans have done an incredibly limited amount of research on plasma because it's really hard to make plasma. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been doing a lot of research on. Um, and we have like, yeah, we have one of the leading plasma machines in the world. Um, so Jet is Jet has done a very good job. Um, you have to get rid of the exhaust products, um, which the other machine has a particularly cool thing to do with. Uh, materials, again, although that we have it magnetically contained, it's still incredibly hot. It's radioactive inside there. And therefore you've got to have really good material that will withstand that challenging environment that you're presenting it with. I mentioned one of our fuels is deuterium. The second fuel is tritium. 
Tritium is not abundant. There is really not very much of it on Earth at all, less than 20 kilos, I believe. And tritium is radioactive. It's a radioactive form of hydrogen. Um, and because there, there's basically none of it on Earth, so in order for us to be able to work out how to handle it properly, um, yeah, we've, we've got a lot of research to do on handling it, producing it, um, disposing it, removing it from materials, all that sorts of things. So we're doing research onto that. Maintenance is also a huge challenge because it's a very difficult environment inside the machine. So we have developed an incredible set of machinery and tools to do our maintenance remotely. And we've also got lots of very skilled um, technicians who are trained in using our maintenance equipment. Um, and this will be super helpful in machines in the future as well. And then innovative engineering is all of the other things that we've had to figure out how to do along the way. Um, we have, I'll give you a very brief overview. We've got JET, so that's big building over here, has JET in it, that's the one where Rianne was talking about the control room of. And I can show you a little video of taking a little tour around the inside, like the around JET itself. MRF is a materials research facility, so they're trying to figure out what to line the inside of the box with. Um, the mast upgrade is a second machine that we have. It is smaller and it has a lot of differences to the jet machine, but it uses the same principles. Race is where we have our remote handling um, technology and technicians, and we have apprentices over slightly off the image. But yes, there is a lot going on on our site. We also have other companies on site as well, not just UK AEA. Beautiful image of the inside of JET. You can see a remote maintenance thing over here. But yes, this is a composite image of the inside of the machine. Very beautiful. Um, here's an image of the outside of the machine. Um, in a second, uh, one of my colleagues will be walking around. Well, you'll see a video of her walking around kind of on the floor over here. There is a scientifically average European man on the right here. It is quite a big machine. Um, that is ITER. ITER is much more advanced than that by now, but ITER is kind of the next generation following JET. Um, MAST upgrade is the other machine we have here on site. So it has a different shaped exhaust. and has very cool stuff going on with its exhaust. And I'm going to exit my PowerPoint here and I am going to show you the clip from my other colleague. I'm also going to check at some point if we have any questions because I might have a minute or two at the end to answer them, maybe. Here we go. Hi, my name is Leah Morgan and I'm a Diagnostic Project Engineer. So we're about to go on a tour of JET and we're currently in the prep room. And it's here you can grab yourself a very snazzy hard hat, keep yourself safe. Um, today I'm also wearing my whites, including my very fancy steel toe boots, don't look at them, they're very dirty. Um, and the whites kind of have two purposes. They're partly to keep our clothes clean, because it's quite dirty when you're lying on the floor underneath JET but it's also partly to be a sort of frame of mind. So if you're wearing your whites, you're focusing because you're doing really, really important work. Now it's going to be kind of loud in there. Um, there's a lot of machinery and people working, so hopefully you'll still be able to hear me okay. But let's go. So right here, you can see the doors that are around Jet. So this big yellow thing right here is an actual door. Um, so although it looks like it doesn't move at all, this thing actually does. It takes like 10 minutes to open and close and we have two of them. And although they're ginormous and weigh hundreds of tons, you'll notice they don't actually go all the way up to the ceiling. And that's because the top part of the wall slides up into the ceiling. And we have two of these called shielding beams and they're over a thousand tons each and they slide up into the ceiling of this building so that there's enough space for the crane to get through. And the crane is what brings things in and out of the tourist hall. So it's really important that you find a way of getting them in and out. 
So this is all part of our bio shield. So it's the big concrete box that we wrap Jet in. So inside Jet, the bio shield is so good at blocking radiation from outside Jet that the radiation levels inside are actually lower. And you'll notice I'm actually wearing another dosimeter. This little purple one is my quarterly dosimeter. This here is an electric one. And after Jet has been operating, everybody who goes in to do work has to wear an electric dosimeter. It is sort of measuring radiation in real time. So if there is something radioactive in the Taurus Hall where we're working, the dosimeter will let us know about it and we can stop work and exit the Taurus Hall swiftly. Although the dosimeters always read zero, as does my quarterly one, just because what we do here is so safe. So this is Jet itself. This is really, really exciting because usually we don't get to come in here. Obviously a lot of the time, because Jet is a science experiment, we're actually using it to do science. And when we're doing that, no one can come into the Taurus Hall. Um, so it's really, really exciting to be allowed to come in here and not have any specific work to do. It feels a bit naughty. Um, you'll be able to see there's loads of people in here at the moment. As I said, it's currently intervention. So anyone who's got a diagnostic and a sensor on the machine is in here right now, quickly fixing it before we do another scientific campaign. And you'll be able to see there's a lot of people up there working on different diagnostics. Around there are sort of temporary scaffolding structures. Um, a lot of the things that we do on JET, a lot of the diagnostics are sort of halfway up the machine. Um, and they're really difficult to get at. So if you want to do any long-term work, something that could take hours or days, um, you need to build a scaffold just to get up to where your diagnostic is. Now on a normal open day, assuming the doors were open, this is as much as you'd usually get to see, um, just because we don't let people wander around the tourist hall. Um, but today I'm going to be able to take you on a little tour around Jet, so follow me. So this here is the neutral beam injector. We have two of them on Jet. Jet is about three stories tall. It is taller than a house. Um, and the neutral beam injectors are the same height, pretty much. Um, so these are part of our heating system. So essentially we take um, ions, we take charged particles, and we speed them up as fast as we can. And then we fire them inside Jet so that the plasma inside, the fusion fuel inside, um, heats up even more, because we're trying to get to 150 million degrees. So these things are really important to us. The neutral beam injectors have a whole team working on them specifically. They're really key to getting to that 150 million degree number. Um, so they are very well looked after. And as I say, we have a whole team ready to work on them. you'll be able to see one of our emergency stop buttons. So I mentioned earlier that we have big gates outside Jet that track whether anyone's inside. We also have cameras in the control room and um, a lot of people just patrolling and making sure no one's here that shouldn't be. So in the event that the lights start flashing and you hear a countdown um, and the doors have closed because you've somehow snuck in, these big emergency stop buttons are here to shut down Jet in an emergency. And you'll see they're all around the edge. So um, again, just part of our safety system, keeping people inside here safe. Around you might see tubes that are traveling between one of the walls all the way into Jet. A lot of these tubes have got lasers inside of them. So lasers just travel through air. You don't usually need to um, do anything to help them move. They move on their own. But you don't want your laser system to get dusty and you don't want things to be put in the way. So a lot of the time um, people wrap their lasers in tubes. So if you see any tubes, a lot of them are lasers. And a lot of our systems actually work with these lasers. Because there's massive magnets inside Jet, it's really difficult to get most things near them because the magnets just divert them. But lasers can go straight through. So if you've got a diagnostic that works using a laser, that is um, a very good choice for a tokamak. You'll be able to see here as well that there's all kinds of um, sort of striped patches on the floor. These are like reinforced areas. So sometimes we need to bring in 
for example, um, the remote handling systems and things like that. So these big stripy uh, spotches, <laughs> spotches on the floor are special areas where we know that it's um, strong enough to be able to take the weight of it because they're quite heavy um, structures. Now there's loads and loads of different size diagnostics all over JET. Um, this one's one of my favorites. It's a relatively old diagnostic and really important for running JET. And you'll be able to see it comes in and out of JET on these rails. Um, so if you need to do work on this system, I believe it's the interferometer, um, you could slide the whole system out, even though it, it really looks like it shouldn't move. Um, you could slide it back and have a look at what's gone wrong or have a look at any diagnostics that are crammed into the edges right at the front that you can't usually get at. Now all around JET there are these walkways and ladders and platforms. Um, I'm told back in the day people used to just scale the outside of JET. Um, obviously health and safety no longer approves of that particular method of reaching your diagnostic. So if you need permanent access to a particular area, um, you will have a nice platform to be able to get you up safely. Right in the middle behind this waterfall of cables is where the vacuum vessel itself is, where that big donut is in the middle of jet. Um, and right now you can't see any of it. There are so many diagnostics in the way, but right underneath there is another walkway that goes around the edge of that donut so that's where this path up here this bridge leads to and that allows you to actually get close to the vacuum vessel um, to see anything that might be happening with it because um, as i say ordinarily you can't really see it not behind the waterfall of cables anyway <laughs> So while I've been a diagnostic project engineer on JET, I've gotten to work on a few different um, diagnostics, a few different areas. One of those is the turbo pumps that control the JET vacuum. Um, and one of them is the high resolution Thompson scattering diagnostic. So up there, you might be able to see what looks like a big plastic white shelf um, that really looks like it shouldn't be there essentially and that is a bunch of neutron shielding that I designed for the high resolution Thompson scattering diagnostic. So the HRTS is a really important diagnostic for JET, it's one of its essential ones. So although JET has over a hundred diagnostics, only some of them are what's considered essential um, and that means that JET can't run unless they're there and able to measure. So they measure things like temperature, density, the positioning of the plasma or the fusion fuel inside the machine. Um, and the high resolution Thompson scattering diagnostic is one of those. They were worried when we would start using tritium again, that there would be so much, um, so many neutrons from the experiment inside because we were doing so much fusion and it was so powerful um, that it would basically cook the fiber optics um, that help the high resolution Thompson scattering diagnostic to work. So I designed this shielding that would protect the fiber optics that are all rolled up up there. Usually you wouldn't have fiber optics in here, but when it was installed, um, a mistake was made. <laughs> so it's all about protecting them now because they're very difficult to move. So that was a really fun project for me. It was really important. And um, yeah, it was cool to work on the HLTS. <laughs> Up here you'll be able to see one of the cranes. Initially these cranes could pretty much spin all the way around, at least that's what I'm told, I was not there. Um, but now there are so many diagnostics on top of jets that they can only really move side to side a little bit, um, which, which makes them slightly less useful, but still really useful if you want to move things here. concludes our tour of JET. I hope you've had a really nice time. I've had a great time showing you around. I've been Leah, back to studio. Fantastic. I don't know if Leah mentioned, but when she kept saying diagnostic, what she meant was a sensor. The people who work on them call them diagnostics. So there you go. Um, do we, I think, we do we have time for questions, Dario? A couple, maybe? Yeah, yeah, we have time for questions. Uh just uh, to let the, the people in the audience know to, to write the, the questions in the in, in the chat box 
you have one comment already, <laughs> but in the meantime, I would like to to thank you so much for for this really nice presentation. Uh, I think it's really good. The well, everything that you're doing in Jet's amazing, and I've never been to Jet before, so I think I felt really compelled to uh, to attend all the all the presentation, all the information. I think it's really nice, also perhaps for the teachers to to maybe see the possibilities to visit Jet. So per, let me start with my own question: uh, Do you think it's uh, how how feasible it is to bring students to Jet at the moment? Is it do you have any special program, any special visits, or how would be? If if a teacher wants to to go to a with a classroom to 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 visit yet, how feasible it is? Um, we have a maximum group size of forty, so that's forty people from your school total. Um, if you are interested in a visit, then send an email to communications at ukaea.uk, and we will let you know um, if it's possible. Um, but yeah, we do have visits for our schools. We do have visits for universities. Um, it is something we like doing. So yes, get in touch. Nice. We'll let nice. you know. All right. So yeah, again, like I said, feel free to write some questions in the chat box. Tiago is happy the way you handle the presentation, especially with the, the issues with the PowerPoint. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. <laughs> thank you, Tiago. We I did practice. I did practice. And then my PowerPoint's just like, no. But okay. Um, what kind of parameters do we put under control? Um, that's a very good question. So one of the things they can do is they can change the shape of the plasma. So I also don't know if she clarified, but when she was saying tokamak, that's this donut shaped um, plasma fusion device. That's the donut shape, essentially. The, the donut shape way of doing fusion is a tokamak. Um, some of the things that they can do is they slice it slice your donut and look at one of the ends. So you have, in it's not a circle, it's not just circular, it is D-shaped. Because D-shape, when they did the very, very first experiments on donut-shaped plasmas, D-shape, well, they discovered that just circular itself is not particularly stable. So they made them D-shape. And now they can look at the shape of the D-shape and you know they can make it thinner, they can make it chubbier, they can kind of move the walls in or out as they want. So they've got really, really good control of the precise shape of this um, using all the many, many magnets that they have on the machine. So that's one thing they can do. They can use different fuels. So Jet can take tritium and deuterium, but they've also done a lot, an enormous number of experiments with deuterium and deuterium. So that is not doing fusion to release huge amounts of energy, but that is more plasma research, working out how does a plasma behave. Some of the things they can do is they can shoot pellets of other stuff into it to see what happens. So they're disrupting the nice normal swirl and seeing what happens. Um, so that's, you get some of the best videos of this from doing that. And it's really, really cool. If you can see a high speed video of I'm shooting a little pellet in and then it kind of swirling around. It's, it's amazing. Um, yes. Also something that I did not see earlier is our mast machine is lower power. It is smaller, it's lower power. And a pulse on mast runs from one to five seconds. And on jet, it runs for 30, 40 seconds. Um, so although jet is huge, it's a really big machine. Eater is gonna make it look small. ETA is also going to be able to run these pulses for much, much longer than JET, mostly because their magnets are cooled properly and ours are copper. Copper gets really hot. So that's pretty much the limiting factor on our, our thing. We will have cryogenic cooling on new machines, but not on the current ones. The images from the inside the tokamak are amazing, but how do you get these? That is a very good question, Fiona. Yes. Um, I recently had a chat with the chap who does the videos for this. So um, the we have windows on the, on the machine, um, very thick. Some of them are made of sapphire because that is more transparent to um, infrared. And some things are better if you you can see some things more clearly if you look at infrared rather than visible light. So the clips that we saw on the screens during Rian's clip in the control room, 
the colorful things you see, that is um, invisible light spectrum, but you actually can't see the plasma. So the plasma is emitting light, but it's emitting it too far above the rainbow, so we can't see it. It's like the noise being too high pitched for us. It's, it's too far up that way, we can't see it. So what we can see, the colors that we can see are the very, very, very coolest parts of it. Um, so when it's touching the edges of the machine, um, it's really relatively to compared to the center. It's much, 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 cool, much cooler. And therefore we can actually see it because it's emitting light in a visible thing. I haven't answered the question, have I? So, <laughs> so we have the windows and we have um, a little, little mirrors that collect the light from going on inside the machine. Then we have a really long tube that brings it all the way over there somewhere. And then it kind of goes up and down and through the, the bio shield. And then your camera equipment is there. So it's a very complicated set of mirrors. But yes, that's a very good question. It's a very good question. They don't have special cameras. They have special mirrors. It's like a periscope. Um, you cannot enter the jet tourist hall for a while due to the radiation levels after the DT campaign. Correct. Yes, so we are continuing to have visits. Um, after this DT campaign, um, there will be a gap. Um, there will be a gap where it needs to cool down, but also this is the last set of experiments that will the jet machine will be doing. Um, after that, it will be decommissioned. So they will start figuring out how to take the thing apart and reduce, reuse, recycle the parts. Um, but yes, we are hoping, we are really hoping that we will be able to do tours um, while it is sitting there, not fully um, disassembled yet. So we're very excited. Um, deuterium out of the seawater, another very good, very good questions, I have to say. Um, the way that we currently do it at the moment, this is Rianne's department, they cool it down to almost zero Kelvin, so minus 273, I think, very, very close to that. And then they separate the hydrogen, as in the normal hydrogen, the deuterium and the tritium, because they have a small window of, like there's a small temperature difference where you can separate them. So they just make it very, very cold. And then you have liquid hydrogen, liquid deuterium, and you can do, um, you can separate them off like oil and water, but just really, really, really cold. Yeah, great questions. I hope you enjoyed it. I think Dario's gonna kick me out now, but yes, I hope you're having a good day. I was never there to kick you out. It was a really amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Julie, for being here with us. Really enjoyed the tour, and I think also our, our attendees uh, really enjoyed it a lot. And thank you for the presentation, the nice questions. And yeah, I think I'm going to be one, trying to be one of the last people to visit you as well. It's really interesting, so <laughs> keep up with the good work. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot. Um, I will send the email address to you in case people want to contact us afterwards. But yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I am off now. Goodbye. All right, Julie. Bye bye. Okay, so thank you everybody for uh, for uh, for being here with us. Um, we will gonna move towards the coffee break, but before we go to the coffee break, I would like to introduce uh, the next session. So the session after the coffee break is gonna be given by our colleagues from the European Commission, the Director General of Energy, DG Ener, and it's gonna we're gonna be discussing about the yeah the visits to the to ITER, which are being sponsored by the European Commission. So this is a pilot project and they're gonna tell us all about it, uh, how the, the, this pilot project went and very important whether it's gonna be repeated or not. So I think this is a really interesting topic. I will not say any more, but I see already our panelists that are connected. So uh, with this, I will, uh, yeah, I will, we will make a 15 minute uh, coffee break, but we really hope to see you back here at, at 15.30. So we can, uh, yeah. So we can uh, continue with our colleagues from DGN. So yeah, enjoy your break and see you in a bit. Okay, welcome everybody back from the coffee break. I hope we are, yeah, we are getting the attendance count up. So people are coming back from the 
from the rest from the break um yeah so i think uh, i think it's a good moment to introduce the the speaker from for the next uh, the next part of the event so like i mentioned before the the break we will have here we have here present um colleagues from the dgner so veronica and clotilde really happy to have you here just uh, to let the people know we we've been working and the 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 visits to the to Ether funded by DGNR for a while and then we met uh, live in the <laughs> at least with Clotilde live in the last visit and with Veronica of course we in other events so really happy to have you here and uh, yeah I think for us is really important that you explain to the to the to attendees to the teachers uh, how these visits came up to life and then what's the the plans for this the outcome and the plans for the future so without further ado I give you the floor and yeah please go ahead uh yeah hello everyone hope the sound is working yes it's working it's great uh thank you so much daria for this introduction uh first of all i wanted to thank you for the invitation and for inviting dgnr indeed as you mentioned we've started this fruitful cooperation and we're very happy to be able to speak to your audiences in the sense to show what we're doing in dgnr and specifically the project that's probably the most interesting to your audience is the is the teachers visits so today uh, for the european commission it's me and my colleague clotilde we both work at uh, dg energy as as uh, dario mentioned and uh, yeah we can uh, we can perhaps start the presentation i just wanted to have a few words so that you can see us before we disappear uh, here <laughs> when we start the presentation so uh, we have a short presentation for you today to cover a few topics. Um, and as you can see uh, just here on the first slide that we work in the ITER unit, which means that we, um, that we work on the ITER project from the commission perspective. It means that we supervise the project, we, we participate uh, in the governance meetings, and we oversee it from the, from, from the side of the European Commission. For you to have have the context a little bit uh, of who we are. Veronica, we don't see the full screen, so we see the presentation, the the slides, but not. Ah, the yeah, I see. You yeah. see, uh, it's a uh, Clotilde sharing. So <laughs> if you can try to uh, put it in the full screen mode. A presentation mode it would be great. Yeah. Just to understand, you see the notes and not the full. Uh... Yeah, exactly. We see the we see the presentation, but not in presentation mode. We just see the. Yeah, okay. we see all the slides on the left. Yeah. And then in the middle, the one that's currently active, and then the notes uh, below. Okay, let me see how to do this, or maybe uh, Dario, uh, you have the presentation. You can mm -hmm. start sharing, maybe because. Yeah. Thank you. Let me send it to one second. If you, in the meantime, you can try to do it your own because I have to organize it here, please. That would be great. Yes. Um... Okay, let me try one last thing and maybe... Now it's the same as before. It's still the same. And what about now? Yes. Okay. Sorry for the double screen. <laughs> okay. So now, now it's fine. Yeah. I suppose. Okay. So you see the first slide again, uh, but we can move on to the next one, which shows the, the outline of the presentation just briefly. So first we will talk about why the EU support fusion and then how. Uh, so this will be more of a general introduction before getting more into the details on the, on the teachers' visits themselves that happened uh, this year. 
And finally, but not least, to keep your um, attention on, maybe at the end we will talk about what will, what might and might not happen in the future. So just a small teaser for that. Uh, so on the next slide, we might start with uh, why does the EU support fusion? I mean, here I think we are among friends, and I don't have to convince anyone that uh, that fusion is is a very promising concept, and it makes sense to to do research on it. Uh, but what I wanted to mention here is that um, it's indeed a long-term project. And um, in the EU or in the European Commission, we have to think about the energy needs, not only for today, but especially for the future, because the energy needs will be increasing. This is, this is very clear. And we would like to be ready for, for when that moment comes. So even though fusion is not the solution for today or for tomorrow, it is still, uh, it is definitely something worth investing in for uh, for the future. And um, an additional uh, added value is that we can see that we nurture this science excellence, if you will, or research and development. And in other words, uh, high level skills in Europe that are, uh, that are very useful and that um, bring added value in the education and in the professionals that we have. And this is a very important um, knowledge to have in Europe so that we can have it inside Europe and we don't have to outsource, uh, outsource it. So in this sense, it's this um, science element and this excellence that we're, we're after. And the last ballot on this, uh, on this slide is that, you know, sometimes you hear, ah, you know, ether or fusion, it's so long in the future. We have to wait so many years before something happens. But in fact, we can see that already today, there are a lot of positive effects on the economy and on the European uh, landscape. On the, I think on the next slide or two, we have some examples. So if, you, if you're into numbers, you can have a look at them and see. Uh, basically, I wanted to mention the concept of the fact that um, if we invest in ITER, what it actually means. It means that ITER gets the money and then this money gets reinvested because there are public procurements and there are contracts placed with uh, European companies who then, you know, have to manufacture the components. So the money that we invest is not something that is thrown out of the window. Of course not. It's something that goes back into the into the ecosystem and that generates the knowledge and the science that I was uh, referring to before. So just to give this into a bit of a perspective to show that there's a lot of benefits already today. And on the next slide, we have even an example of some, we, we call it spin-off effects. You can call it whatever you want to, but basically the concept is that a lot of the technology that is developed for ether can already today be used in uh, in other fields that were maybe not planned, but somehow they they can be they can be used. So, for example, on the right, the picture of the Airbus. So, in the past, this cockpit it had to be welded together, all these pieces. But from what I understand, thanks to the technology developed uh, for ITER, um, the manufacturer is now able to uh, create this cockpit as, as one piece, thanks to the technology developed for ITER. So this is just a bit of the argument uh, why we support fusion and uh, why it matters uh, already today. Uh, yes, and we move on to the second, maybe even more important section, how do we do it? So we say it's so important, we support it, but um, how do we do it? So just briefly, to tell you specifically how it happens. So the European Union contributes 45% to the ITER project. Um, ITER, uh, as you might know, has uh, seven members, meaning that if Europe has 45%, it's almost half of the project. It means that for the, for the six other members, there is around 9%, which means that uh, the responsibility lies primarily with, with Europe which makes sense because ITER is hosted on, on European soil in the south of France, as you probably all know. So it, it makes sense. Um, it also means that Europe is responsible for, for around half of the components. For your information, uh, the, the fact that uh, Europe or other countries contribute to ITER, what does it mean? So the, the contribution can take uh, two forms. Either it's an in-cash contribution, so, so money that you, that you give to ITER, 
um, or in-kind contribution. And these are the components. And this is actually the, the core contribution. This is the more important contribution in the sense that those would be the, the components that are then put together and form the, the ether machine. Uh, you can see it's an expensive project and that for the period 2021 and to 2027, the EU allocated 5.61 billion to the project. So I don't know if it gives you some kind of a scale. It's, it's a lot of money, of course, but, but, uh, but worth it. I wanted to briefly mention that in the European Commission, me and Clotilde, we represent uh, DGNR, as I mentioned, but there is another directorate general, if, you, if just for your information, if it's ever relevant, that uh, that works with um, works with ITER and Fusion and is DG Research and Innovation. So it, they are more linked, let's say, to Eurofusion and, and these activities, but just for the context. What I wanted to mention on this slide at the last point is the Fusion for Energy. I don't know if you've ever heard about this organization, but Fusion for Energy is the domestic agency, uh, the European domestic agency for ITER. What it means is that Fusion for Energy is the agency responsible for delivering the EU contribution to ITER. So what does it mean in real terms? In real terms, it means that there are around 400 people in Barcelona. These are the, this is the staff of the agency. And it's uh, primarily a public procurement agency, which means they do public procurement, they procure the components, then they sign the contract with European companies, which then manufacture the component, which is then delivered to ITER. So I just want to give an example or show you how, how it actually works, this whole, how does ITER happen with this contribution? And... On the next slide, is it still for me or maybe it's time? Yeah, no, indeed. It's time actually to move to perhaps the most important or interesting part for you of the presentation. And this is specifically the ITER teacher's visit. So I gave you a bit of a general, general background. And um, now uh, you can hear more about the project that happened this year and uh, where we brought teachers to see ITER for themselves. So I pass the word to, to my colleague, Clotilde. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, thanks for uh, for this introduction on the context. As you have heard, uh, Europe is the main stakeholder in the ITER project and is, uh, has been investing a lot and for a long time in uh, fusion research. So, of course, we have uh, uh, a particular interest to support uh, the ITER project and uh, fusion research in general uh, at uh, different levels. Um, so in the future, we, we will actually need a fusion specialist, uh, and that's why we came up uh, with this um, EU teachers' visits to ITER initiative with the objective to increase the level of uh, awareness and knowledge about ITER among uh, young Europeans through a direct uh, teacher-student uh, contact and uh, with the ultimate goal of hopefully inspiring some of your students to consider fusion as a possible education or professional career. Uh, since we are the European Commission, we, we focus, of course, on the European dimension. And so the idea is to bring together uh, secondary school teachers from all over the European uh, Union to visit uh, the ITER side, but also to discuss together, uh, to share experiences and knowledge, et cetera. Uh, but now we, we have now a look at, the, let's say, a typical uh, visit day. Uh, so on this slide, you have a, the agenda of uh, the past visits. We start at nine at the Eater side, which is uh, in Cadarache, south of France. And it's uh, more or less uh, one hour drive from uh, Aix en Provence. So we start early the day. Um, we equip with the special workwear, as you can see in the picture. We, it's a work site, so you need a special security, uh, a special work, uh, workwear for security reason. And then we have a presentation of the ITER project, a general presentation given by uh, the ITER organization staff. It's followed normally by a virtual reality session, which is a sort of a virtual tour in the machine. 
uh, where you can see uh, more in detail uh, the components and how the machine uh, would work. And this uh, reality session is given as well by a technical person working for uh, ITER. After that, we get to the highlight of the uh, of the day, which is the worksite tour. Um, the worksite tour can differ a bit depending on the day, depending on what's available on the site, but it's open for security reason again. But uh, normally what we have uh, is um, uh, a tour on the um, magnets factory and uh, the assembly hall. So you can see, for example, in this picture, in the middle, you have uh, uh, the assembly hall. That's where uh, all the... Um, the components of the machine are pre-assembled, so assembly all before being transported to the tokamak pit. On the right, you have a, a picture of uh, the, the vacuum vessel, a sector of the vacuum vessel, for example. After the work site tour, we have a well-deserved lunch break in the canteen of the organization. And then the afternoon is dedicated uh, to the European contribution to the project and it's led by the uh, European Commission. So we have a short presentation on to give you the contents, uh, context of uh, fusion research in Europe and on the European contribution uh, to the project. We have as well a presentation by FuseNet on uh, the already available teaching materials already to equip you with some tools for the next part uh, of the teacher's visits program. And then we do a workshop. So we split the group into uh, smaller groups and uh, you start uh, brainstorming already and coming up with some practical ideas on how to transfer the knowledge that you have acquired for, uh, throughout the days. So, so how to transfer this knowledge and, uh, and teach the ITER project and fusion to your students. So as you can see, it's quite a, a full day. Uh, here on, on the left, for example, you have uh, your colleagues uh, explaining the idea they've come up with uh, during the workshop. And I have to say that we, we heard already some very interesting uh, and creative idea on how to transmit and share this knowledge uh, once you're back to your school. Uh, but then also we have a bit of networking because the idea is not just to have a full immersion in the ITER project and the world of fusion research, but uh, uh, what we do as well is that we gather uh, unique groups of people from different countries. Uh, just to give you an example, we had three uh, visits this year. They took place all over the summer, so on the 16th and 30th of June and on the 30th of August. And just to give you an idea, on the first visit, uh, we had uh, 35 uh, teachers from 20 countries. On the second visit, again, 35, but from 21st, uh, 21 countries. And on the third one, we had 30 uh, teachers from 17 countries. So it's quite a unique group. Uh, it's very mixed with different countries. You all have different backgrounds. You work in different school system. But of course, you have a lot of in common as well, and you have common challenges. So it's important also the, this networking part. So you get to, to know each other before the visit day itself. Uh, you normally arrive in Aisan Provence the day before. And uh, yes, we have a nice dinner together. You start to know each other so that the next day is also less uh, awkward for you because you have already met and uh, you're going to spend the day together and you know already a little bit of uh, each other. And then on the right, you see the pictures is uh, the day after, I mean, the day of the visit in the evening. This is the first visit, I believe, the group. And uh, they decided to spontaneously meet afterwards. So just to say that uh, this network is also bringing it, uh, to the creation of some informal networks uh, that you know have uh, a life after um, after the visit itself. As I said, so these initiatives, these uh, sort of structures in two parts. So we have the the visit itself, but we also have follow up activities. So as a follow up to the visit, each participant is asked uh, to transfer the knowledge. Uh, 
and the information they they gained uh, uh, to their students because uh, as i said at the beginning our target is uh, your students um so we ask you to share the knowledge with your students you have freedom in the format there is no specific format you are uh, free to organize uh, your activity in your school uh, as you wish um what we ask you to do afterwards is to simply report on your activity. So we share a reporting form and we ask a question about the number of students you have reached uh, or um, a short description, a description of the activity. Uh, so the idea is that we provide you with the knowledge, hopefully with the tools uh, uh, already, with some inspiration during the day through the workshop or the presentation from Fuse with some teaching materials. And then it's your turn to do some work, to, uh, to do some activities and report, um, report to us, uh, to actually show that this initiative has an impact as an impact and it's useful. And uh, once you submit your reporting form, we also issue a nice official certificate that you can hang uh, at home or in your, um, in your office, in your school. So that's in a nutshell what uh, the uh, teacher's visits to ITER look like. Uh, now I would pass the floor back to Veronica who can tell us more about uh, our next edition. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Clotilde. I think the, the presentation you gave about this year has has uh, must have really triggered a lot of interest, I believe, in, in our um, audience. So I think the natural next question would be, so this is nice, this has happened this year. Is there something in it for me? Would you maybe do a next edition next year? So in this sense, on the next slide, you can see that... Um, this could be you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that so far it seems that we would be able to replicate in or, or do a similar activity next year. Uh, this is what I would like to present uh, to you here at this point. So um, what we are planning or hoping to do next year, it's because of the success of the activity this year. We had uh, quite positive feedback and we believe that this activity really deserves another addition or in continuation. Uh, of the same efforts, um, we would like to do something similar next year. This year, as, as Clotilde said, we brought uh, 100 teachers in total to ITE. Next year, maybe it will be a little bit less, um, it, uh, just for, for you to know. Uh, but uh, then the program and all the other elements would probably be quite comparable. So what you've just heard from Clotilde is something that we would like to do again in, in very similar terms next year. Um, I don't have yet the details in terms of, let's say, the date or when, when things will happen. But what I can tell you already now is that for sure, once we launch the application procedure and the selection procedure, we will uh, let uh, FuseNet know. So Dario and Mira, they will know about this and they will be able to forward you this, um, this invitation or this uh, request for application or whatever you want to call it. So for you, in case you are interested uh, to, to know about it, the first thing would be to, to make sure that your email is available to, to Dario or to Mira or to Fusnet uh, in the sense that they would be able to forward you this, uh, this email once um, this invitation once we launch it. And uh, already at this stage on the next slide, I wanted to inform you briefly kind of what to expect, because maybe you think, ah, yes, maybe I want to apply, but what does it mean? What, how does that work? So I wanted to explain a little bit how the application procedure works and which selection criteria we have so that you know what more or less to expect in case you decide to, to put forward an application. Um, the application is a simple form, online form which is circulated uh, to, to people via an email. So there is an email with an invitation and it includes a link to a form. In the form, you are uh, asked to fill in some of your, some general personal details. And then there are also some categories to fill in so that then we can, based on them, uh, perform the, the selection procedure. So in this sense, uh, for the selection criteria, um, the, the first one, and probably the most important one, is the geographical balance. 
So of course we are looking for a representation of all the EU EU member states, um, which means that of course if you're from a bigger country, we will probably be able to bring more people from your country. If you're from a smaller one, we will probably only be able to bring a smaller number of of teachers. This this makes sense. Um, I also wanted to mention that we're looking for geographical balance, not only one country to another country, but ideally we're also looking for geographical balance within a country. So if we have more many applications from one country, we try to accept um, people from, let's say, different regions on different cities. Uh, I'm saying this here because I know that it might be appealing to think, ah, maybe me and my colleague, uh, you know, from the same school, we could go and it would be nice. Unfortunately, we would most probably not be able to accept uh, two teachers from the same region, from the same country and from, from the same school. So just to manage, manage your expectations in this sense. Uh, the second criteria is gender balance. That's quite self-explanatory, so I will not spend time on that. Uh, the subjects thought. So at the beginning of this activity, we were considering accepting only STEM, uh, STEM teachers, teachers who teach uh, STEM subjects. But we actually figured out that uh, ITER is very interdisciplinary and it can be presented in a lot of different ways and in a lot of different uh, subjects. There are economic aspects, uh, diplomatic, project management. So this is what we actually saw from the workshops um, at the ITER uh, teachers visit this year. The teachers that when they were thinking how to present ITER, there were many ideas how to present it from a different angle than maybe the most obvious one uh, with physics. Another criteria we, we apply is English skills, and this is purely for practical reasons. This is because the visit itself takes place in English. So we uh, request the participants to confirm that they are able to follow the visit in this sense. So I want to mention that you don't, do not have to be proficient. You don't have to you know, have the best English in the world but you have to be able to follow the visit and to interact with, with people from, from different countries. So this is, this is why this uh, requirement is there or this criteria is there. Uh, of course, availability to visit either on the proposed dates. As I say, we do not know yet the dates for, for next year. Tentatively, it will be spring next year, but I don't have exact dates yet, as I said. And the last point is the motivation. Um, so as you can see, the criteria above are quite uh, formalistic or quite, you know, ticking a certain box. And um, if, um, if we have more candidates who fulfill the criteria to the same level, these, the criteria above, motivation is the deciding factor in the end. I mentioned this specifically so that uh, in case you decide to apply, you, you think of the motivation a little bit. You don't have to worry about it too much because it's short. I think we ask about 100 words, so we don't have to, you know, write any longer text. But it is something that uh, if, if you, for example, as I mentioned, we will not be able to take uh, two teachers from the same school. So I'm sorry to introduce this element of competition. But in the end, if all the other um, data are the same, uh, then the motivation that is more um, convincing will be the one that will be the, the, the deciding factor. Um, with this, I believe I have covered the application, the selection criteria, the next edition. I'm thinking there is something more to mention other than stay tuned. As I mentioned, we will launch the, we will probably launch the, the application at the beginning of next year. This is still tentative, but as I said, you will you will know about it if you want to know about it. And um, with this, I think. Uh, this is uh, this was the last thing I wanted to mention. So once again, thank you for your attention, and we hope that this sparked your interest and that you believe as much as we do that the ITER teachers visit are an excellent initiative to bring fusion closer to to the regular citizens and especially to the young students who are maybe not aware of it or who will otherwise not be in contact with it because we see and we believe that if the teacher is able to go in person to to see ITER then of course the the possibility to transfer the knowledge is a bit stronger because this personal experience is really something that uh, that you cannot get from from internet or from the books 
So thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for, for some questions, if there are any questions. We thought of some questions ourselves in case, <laughs> in case there are none, but uh, maybe there are some from the audience. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Veronica and Clotilde. So yeah, please, in, in the meantime, if you have any question, please write it in the, in the Q&A box. But I just want to tell you that, um, that yeah, I think the, the, the need for an ITER visit is something that we have experienced during our previous events. So always when we, when we mention ITER and we introduce ITER, there is, has always been the, the express uh, interest of the attendees of the teachers saying, okay, well, how can we get there? How is the possibility? So I think the, the DGN is, is targeting uh, something that is that it was requested for a long time. So that's really nice. And thank you so much for explaining the requirements because yeah, it is sometimes difficult. Uh, when you apply, you really don't know what to expect. And like you said, maybe two colleagues apply and then there is the, the issue like, hey, why my colleague got accepted and me not? So I think that's really clear why. And, and yeah, and I, I would like to, to tell you and also the attendees that, of course, in the moment that you make the, the call public, we will uh, advertise it to through the list that we have of attendees. So this happened for the previous visit. So the teachers that are currently attending and registered to this event, they will have the, the invitation uh, available in their, in their uh, email. So to all the teachers, please keep us keep us out of the spam box <laughs> because we, we will, as soon as we get this from, from Veronica and Clotilde, we will send you uh, an email uh, linking to the application uh, for this, for this event. So yeah, I think um, there are a couple of questions. Uh, can you read them on your panel or do you want me to read it for you, Veronica and Clotilde? There's the Q and A panel. So the last two questions. Uh... I see one question. Does it mean that people from the UK would not be eligible? This is the question I see. That's unfortunately correct. Uh, it's for EU member states. We, we are we are sorry about the, the Brexit situation, but it is what it is. Okay, that was that was very clear, I guess. So yeah, thank you very much. I think there are no more questions. We have our next speaker here. So again, we will see each other uh, for the upcoming uh, upcoming initiative. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, and good to see Kirsten as well, who was there with us at the teachers' visit. So I feel like we're a family here almost. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Well, that was the, the presentation from DGNR. And then, yeah, we come to at the, a point on the event where everybody says ITER. Now we mentioned that ITER is the, the, the place to be. Now we know how to get it, to get to ITER to, from the European Commission. And now we get the shining star, never, never said better for, <laughs> for the time. So we have the ITER presentation here and we have Kirsten Hopp from the ITER communication office. And like Veronica said, Kirsten is so, of course involved in the in the ITER teacher visit. She was our guide and she has a lot of experience in, in ITER and, and in the communication office. So we're really happy to have her here. And Kirsten, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I was really pleased to hear about all the experience that were shared um, following the previous visits this summer. I mean, as uh, you just said, I was involved in that, and I'm really happy to hear that uh, there was such positive feedback. I also believe that it is absolutely important to use um, the the avenue via the schools and the teachers to spread the word about fusion. I mean, we are really happy that we have this collaboration on that. So what I'm going to do today um, I'm uh, going to tell you a little bit about uh, about the ITER project. Um, of course, um, it uh, it can only be a very short summary. I would really recommend you uh, to to apply for the opportunity to come here. I mean, it's always best to see things with your own eyes, and uh, it's it's really um, a great place to be. So you see on the screen already here. Um, with the Beatles, I'm telling you that here comes the sun. That's what we are doing. We are bringing the sun down to earth. I will, I will have to warn you that um, everything is a lot shorter than I would normally talk about, but it uh, gives you a little bit of a teaser, I should hope, and uh, it, will, uh, uh, it will invite you to look more into the subject matter. And uh, I have already discussed with Dario um, in the preparation for this event today that I will also share more material after this presentation that will help you to get into this entire subject matter. So yes, um, 
bringing the sun, I'm getting, I'm not getting, ah, here, here, here it is. Yeah, bringing the sun down to earth. I mean, what we do is we bring fusion down to earth. Fusion is, of course, I mean, you all know that. I don't need to say much on this. Um, fusion is what uh, runs our universe, so to speak. It's what uh, powers our suns and stars, also our sun. And uh, we want to replicate that um, process on earth because we believe that it is, um, um, a, a very uh, um, valuable process to bring clean energy uh, uh, into our future. Um, what are the challenges here? I'm diving right in. What you see on the screen is the device that we are building here. That's a tokamak. A tokamak is an abbreviation from a Russian term and means toroidal, um, coil, uh, toroidal chamber with magnetic coils and uh, in there we will replicate a fusion uh, reaction you see it on the right it's not exactly the same thing when that happens in the sun but it's a uh, close anyway you see the two isotopes of uh, hydrogen deuterium and tritium when they fuse they create helium and a neutron and the neutron is what we are really after the neutron carries a lot of energy expressed here in mega electron volt but to give you an image of how energetic that particle is, the neutron coming out of the uh, fusion reaction here on Earth would reach the moon in eight seconds. So that's the magnitude of energy we are talking about. That's what we would like to harvest. But of course, there are challenges uh, uh, attached to that. It's not easy. If it was easy, we would have fusion energy already. Um, it starts with the temperature in the sun, the temperature needed for fusion. Um, if you were here, I would ask you the question whether you would know the temperature in the in the sun. It's 15 million centigrades, but we need 10 times that temperature, 150 million centigrades. Now that's really difficult to handle. There is no material in the entire universe that could manage this kind of uh, temperature. So what we do is we create a magnetic cage. Hence this uh, technology is called magnetic confinement fusion. We create a cage with a system of magnets, and uh, uh, by doing that, we will be we we will be able to run this fusion reaction. Uh, now, of course, there is the next challenge: how do you manage to build this cage? Uh, you have um, you have some magnets. I will introduce them in a moment, but these magnets need to be incredibly powerful. And in order to get them powerful, they need to be superconducting. Now, how do you get there? You cool the magnets down. So we have to cool them down to four Kelvin. Now you hear already the challenge there. We will have particles in the plasma, um, so highly energetic with a temperature of 150 million centigrades. And we have magnets only a couple of meters away from there uh, that are cooled down to four Kelvin. So that's the temperature gradient that doesn't exist anywhere else in the universe once we start doing that here. So that's quite a challenge. The next challenge is a burning plasma. A burning plasma is uh, uh, almost akin to um, perpetuum mobile, not quite the same thing, uh, uh, but it's it's coming close. Uh, burning plasma it means that we keep the energy that we also create with uh, the helium particle, or you would probably say the alpha particle, and we keep that inside the plasma to continue heating the plasma. That's what's called a burning plasma, and that's one of the goals, Adita. And of course, we need to capture the neutrons because the neutrons will not be affected by the magnetic cage. They don't carry a charge. So we need to uh, make sure that we can catch them. And we do that with elements. I hope you can see the cursor. Uh, we do that. We do that with uh, uh, blanket modules in the walls here. You will see in a moment a better picture of that. And uh, behind these blanket modules, we run water. So it's actively cooled. We run water at a very high flow rate. Um, and uh, that carries the energy off. Um, why are we so keen on fusion? Well, one, fusion is clean. Um, there is no CO2 emission from, fu uh, from fusion. Fuels are abundant. Uh, deuterium is plenty available in the water. Every 6,000 atom in the water is deuterium. Tritium is a bit more difficult. Tritium, we have to breed. We have to breed with lithium to have enough at the moment for ITER. We have sufficient uh, supplies. But for the future, already for the demo reactor, we need to master uh, the tritium breeding inside this chamber here. And here you can see the blanket modules mm, all around. Uh, safety is, of course, an issue. Um, you might hear by my accent, I come from Germany. So in Germany, we just closed uh, the last three nuclear reactors this year. Of course, it's an older technology, a different technology, that's fission. Um, but there are, of course, uh, certain 
um, uh, uh, concerns about nuclear um, technology. We don't have the same safety issues with fusion. There is no, you know that, I don't actually need to tell you that, there is no danger of a chain reaction with uh, fusion. Uh, there will be some radioactivity. In fact, tritium is radioactive, as you know, with a half-life of 12 years. And you have these elements in the chamber that activate. So they become radioactive and need to be put away every couple of years. But in comparison with fission, with the conventional nuclear energy production, it's much, much less of a burden in terms of uh, uh, safety. So that is manageable. But the efficiency is really what's uh, um, absolutely amazing. You see this image and you might question what does the pineapple do there and all the coal. Well, if you were to compare the energy output from these two different sources of energy, I mean, if you were to use fusion fuel in the weight of a pineapple, let's say 750, 800 grams, you would be able to generate as much energy, electricity as from 10,000 tons of coal. I think that's a good driver to pursue this technology. It's, uh, it's really mind boggling at times. So what do we do at ITER? Uh, ITER's main task is to show the feasibility of fusion at an industrial level. So it's not just to show that it works, that fusion works. We know that we can do it, but we cannot do it yet at a level that can be exploited on an industrial level. So that's what we need to do. And that's why ITER is the size uh, we are. What we are not doing at ITER is we are not producing electricity. Uh, that needs to be clear. I mean, we are set up to really uh, uh, demonstrate that technologically we can manage the fusion reaction in a setup like uh, this tokamak here. Um, the burning plasma I have mentioned and uh, another very important issue is this Q equals or bigger than 10. That's the gain ratio. What we are doing at ITER, we are putting 50 megawatt in at heating power into the fusion reaction and we expect to have 500 megawatt output. So if that is still not enough uh, as, uh, as it goes for uh, electricity production, but it will give us the burning plasma and that's uh, an important goal. And of course, there are other things that come from uh, from the ITER project. I mean, there are um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of information, a lot of input to the wider uh, international fusion community. Uh, ITER provides a lot of expertise and knowledge on uh, uh, issues related to the building of a fusion reactor. You see it here, the design, the fabrication and the licensing. Um, there's also an aspect of um, the economy, meaning supply chains and industrial uh, capacity that was recently in and um, a survey put out by the Fusion Industry Association that would be really worthwhile if somebody is interested to delve into this deeper. And then your role comes in, I mean, building a fusion workforce. I mean, you're talking to student, to high school students, but eventually some of them might get interested in studying physics and even taking the path of studying plasma physics or become a fusion expert. So spreading the word about this um, is very, very important because in the future, the future fusion reactors, they need to be manned. I mean, we need to have experts um, working there. Um, I'm running you through some of the main elements really quickly. Um, you can find all of that information on our website. It's, it's all there. What you see here is uh, the vacuum vessel. To give you an idea of scale, you see the person down below here. Um, the vacuum vessel is uh, manufactured by Korea and by Europe and consists of nine uh, sectors. You see that I'm mentioning countries and I'm coming back to that. So what you see here is a symbolized plasma. It's not quite right, neither in color nor in size. Uh, but the figures on the right there will tell you the space inside the chamber is 1400 cubic meters. The plasma volume is 840. That tells you what I have told you earlier, that we are creating a cage in which the fusion reaction takes place. So the plasma is not supposed to touch the walls. Um, and then what's interesting, you see the space, the figures for the space. There will never be more than two grams of fuel inside the chamber, which is really absolutely Mind boggling. I'm not a physicist and I'm struck by this every time when I talk about it. Two grams of fuel at any given time inside that large space. It's not for nothing called the vacuum chamber. Let's move on to the magnetic cage. 
Uh, you see three systems here. Again, there is a person down here to give you a sense of scale. Uh, you have three main magnetic systems in the center. It's the central solenoid consisting of six modules that are actually poloidal field coils manufactured in the United States by General At uh, Atomics. The second system is uh, the D-shaped uh, toroidal field coils. There are 18 of those. Uh, two are always associated with one sector of the vacuum vessel, and they are manufactured in Japan and in Europe. And then you have six in this uh, burgundy kind of color here. Um, these are poloidal field coils, very large, ranging from 10 meters over 17 to 24 meters to some of the largest magnets ever. And uh, the whole magnet system together, um, the, its role is to, of course, confine the plasma, keep it away from the wall, hence the term magnetic confinement fusion. That's um, our largest component, so to speak. That's a cryostat. The cryostat is practically a thermos, like a thermos flask to protect the vacuums inside and also the, the low temperature. It's 30 meters high, 30 meters wide. You see that person down here again. And here the parts had been manufactured in India and then brought here to ITA, where it's been welded together in four sections, the base section, the lower cylinder, the upper cylinder, and the top lid. I'm saying that because you will recognize a few of these things in, in pictures later. So when everything then starts working, we inject the fuel in the way of a gas, then uh, the central solenoid will run a current within the gas, uh, heat it up, turns it into a plasma, and then we have an, a, additional external heating from various sources, including microwaves and a neutral beam source. And uh, the magnets come into play, of course, to confine all that. And then we combine all of this to get the, uh, the plasma 250 million degrees. And then the challenge remains to actually keep it contained and uh, contained and high in temperature so that it doesn't cool down and allows us um, continuous fusion reactions. Let me say a few words on the history of ETA. Uh, again, you can read all this up on our website side it is astonishing or it's it's the remarkable not astonishing it's remarkable that the ETA project goes back to the cold war um you see that here during the disarmament talks in geneva in 1985 reagan and gorbachev agreed to develop fusion energy and i quote from the agreement for the benefit of all mankind it took some time until the agreement was signed in 2006 and uh, on the bottom right you see an image it's one of our recent images uh, that's how it looks like today um, now, here you see the members of uh, ETA. It's uh, uh, um, seven members combining 35 countries. These 35 countries represent half of the global population and about 85% of the global GDP. You see Europe here. Uh, and until recently, um, actually, the 35 is no longer valid. It's 34 now because until recently, the UK was still part of this. But uh, um, a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, we had word that uh, the UK will not remain in Euratom and uh, membership um, in this EU, the, in the, under the EU umbrella went through Euratom. Uh, but we have heard, had a, a word, of course, from the UK that they will continue their cooperation with ETA and we will see what kind of form that takes in the future. Um, one a word on the contributions. It's very unique with ETA. Normally with an international organization, uh, members pay into the pot and the organization does what it does as per mandate. At ETA, it's different. Only 10% are paid in cash. 90% are paid in kind. That means that the countries are building parts of the machine themselves. That's very unique. And that is why I had mentioned the countries before that manufacture one or the other component. So that's really unique. And it uh, results, of course, in, uh, in creating expertise in the countries, creating industry, creating jobs, and creating a sense of ownership in the country. So it's a very good uh, vehicle to bring all these countries on board. Now, um, we have, uh, I will tell you a little bit about recent progress and challenges, but in a very short way, because I have lots of images later. Um, what you see here is one of the milestones that is from last year. Um, that whole thing is a vacuum vessel module. What you see here, uh, shown by the yellow arrow, is a sector of the vacuum vessel. So that's what you see here on the inside. Now you heard me talking about the temperatures. Let me just show you that again. In here, you will have 
a, a, a plasma at the temperature of with particles at a temperature of 150 million centigrades. And here is the magnet. And that will have inside a cooling agent, which is helium, at 4 Kelvin. Now, we need to do something about that, right, to prevent the heat um, emanating from the inside to get to the magnets. And we do that with thermal shields. You see that thin line here? That's a thermal shield, very thin. Um, and uh, that is being cooled down by helium as well, by gaseous helium, and that will take care of that uh, temperature gradient. Now, that was the first module that was actually put into the vacuum, uh, into the tokamak. So you see it here. That's the module. This whole structure, what you see here, is the tokamak pit. The structure in the middle is another tool that's, uh, that is an assembly tool to support uh, these vacuum vessel sectors. Now that was great in May 2020, but then, and now I come to some challenges, um, then we uh, discovered a few problems. Um, one of the problems were div uh, uh, deviations in the geometrical shape of uh, these lines here. These are the areas where the vacuum vessel sectors are being welded together to form the entire uh, torus of the vacuum chamber. So we have deviations there um, that need to be uh, taken care of, that need to be repaired. Um, we have, over the summer, had a lot of negotiations with companies around the world and have um, uh, identified a company that will take care of these repairs. So this is happening now. Uh, preparations are um, ongoing now so that these repairs can start. We've had a second big problem uh, with a thermal shield. And you see here these thin lines on the surface. Um, these thin lines are the conduits for the cooling agent, the gaseous helium that runs through there at a temperature of 80 Kelvin. So that's minus 193 degrees. Unfortunately, what we found, you see it already in the text, we saw that there is leakage from these pipes. Uh, unfortunately, when they manufactured these uh, uh, components, um, they used a cleaning fluid that contained chlorine, and obviously that cleaning fluid was not con completely removed. And over time, uh, it created stress corrosion, and that stress corrosion then creates created leaks. So you can't have that, obviously, right? You cannot have leaks into uh, uh, into the environment there, into the vacuum, and you can't lose the cooling agent. So you know you can uh, say goodbye to fusion if you have such leaks. So it's in a way, a blessing in disguise that we discovered these issues that we can now concentrate on repairing them. I will show you some images on that. Again, a contract has already been uh, um, made with a company to repair this. So there are two approaches to this. Some of these uh, parts uh, are being repaired. The damage is um, at an extent that it can be repaired, but there are others that have to be manufactured from scratch, which is too bad, but a better choice than uh, uh, than having extensive repair work. So this is ongoing right now. And unfortunately that resulted in taking this uh, module out again. So that was a sad day earlier this year, that was in July. And uh, we had to take it out, um, this whole module, and it's now in the assembly hall, you see it in a moment. Uh, so what, what are the challenges overall? I uh, told you about these deviations, the need for repairs, but there are others. We have delays, of course, because of COVID. We also have delays because it's almost like in the nature of this entire project. We are doing all of this for the first time at this scale with this international cooperation. It is normal to expect delays in that. I mean, uh, the COVID is just an um, additional factor in there. We also had issues with licensing, so we are working to uh, with the, with the uh, French authorities to get that moving. And um, you will not know about that, but we've um, we've been looking into um, developing a new baseline, so a new schedule for this project because of uh, the delays. We need more time and because of the repairs as well. The first ideas of this new baseline were uh, presented last week to ETA Science and Technology Advisory Committee. Um, they have uh, uh, viewed it favorably, so they support the ideas. The next is coming up uh, later this month. There will be a review by another body that's a management advisory uh, committee, and then it will go to the ETA Council, which is the governing uh, body of ETA with representatives of all the members. Uh, and we will we hope to have a clear 
um, direction then in 2024 and uh, clear answers to all the questions how long it's going to go because that uh, that question you can ask it but I can't answer it to you today at the same time um, we have been of course also in discussions at all levels here how we can still continue with uh, assembly and with manufacturing and this indeed is uh, being worked at and it's continuing in parallel um, this has also been taken into consideration when the new baseline was developed that we can continue with certain works that we don't stop everything just because of the repairs so um this is for the presentation. I have no idea of the time. I don't have the time uh, uh, running on my screen. What I will do next is I am going to take you into the assembly hall uh, where um, my colleague Sabina Griffith and myself, uh, we recorded a few small clips for you. And uh, I just need to call up this video. You're running fine with the time, so don't worry. Yeah, OK, so, thank yeah. you, thank you, thank you. So new share. Yes, please. Okay, and then I need to do the volume, right? Okay. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I hope it's running. Uh, Dario, if you can just give me a thumbs up that it's going okay so that I know. Okay, put it on. Hi, good afternoon. This is Kirsten again. I'm now on the ETA work site and uh, specifically I am in the assembly hall and with me is uh, Sabina Griffith, my colleague in communication and uh, she will explain to you a little bit what we can see here before I take you on our virtual tour. Sabina? Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Sabina uh, and uh, so yeah, I would like to just give you a first-hand glance at uh, what the ITER assembly hall looks like right now uh, and what beautiful toys we have lying around here. Right behind me you see is one sector out of nine of the ITER vacuum vessel. Um, it's made and uh, delivered by South Korea. It's a Korean contribution and uh, unfortunately as Kirsten uh, has explained we are at this phase of the ITER project, unfortunately, we are disassembling a lot of components because we discovered some um, yeah, uh, problems with thermal shields and the alignment of the vacuum vessel sectors. But the repairs are, on, uh, are uh, ongoing and the contracts are in place. So very soon, I hope we will move again into the other direction. On the right hand side here we have we have what we call the upending tool uh, just to maneuver these large and heavy components weighing over 300 tons some of them we need special tools and they are also a Korean contribution and this one is like a chair a stool to lift the components that arrive here in the hall vertically to uh, you pan them to have them in the vertical position so that our big gantry cranes can pick them up and take them over to what we call the sub-assembly tool. So, and this is one of the two big cranes that we have to prepare one sector before it goes into the pit which is on the other side of the wall. So here we stand in front of the second sub-assembly crane and what you see here in front of me is one of the nine vacuum vessel sectors plus the thermal shielding, the silver shiny uh, coating there is the thermal shield. It is lined with pure silver because silver has the highest reflection rate. And you can also see if you look very sharply uh, the, the piping structure on there and that's the problem child where we have these corrosion cracks. So this is being dismantled, disassembled right now. Uh, on the left you see another big TF coil, toroidal field coil. Once everything is put together to form a sector module, it weighs 1,300 tons and it goes, it will be picked up by the big gantry cranes, it goes up into the air, over the wall and into the chocolate bed. This plot here is for the assembly of the central solenoid, which is the magnet in the center of the machine, the largest and most powerful magnet ever built on Earth. Um, it contains superconductors from Japan, and, but the whole 
magnet is being built by General Atomics in San Diego, California. It is shipped here in six models. Uh, in total, it will be 18 meters high. And we have now three models on site. Two of them are being stacked on top of each other right now. And this is a very delicate and tricky operation. But unfortunately, we cannot access to the viewing point because they are performing some work. And you see, it says, do not open even for a look. And we have to respect that. But I know that Kirsten has a lot of very cool 360 uh, images she will show to you in her virtual tour right after this. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so and as Sabina said, I'm going to do another new share and uh, I'm going to go into the 360 um, images. And uh, again, uh, Dario, if you can just give me a thumbs up that we are okay. I have to go actually into the beginning. We can okay. See it. Yeah. You can see it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to maximize it. Is it still okay? Can you see it? Yeah, so here you have a wonderful view of the ETA worksite from the top. Um, actually, I have to tell you that um, that you are inc incredibly lucky because uh, these images are absolutely fresh and new. I've, not me, I've not taken them, but I have had a drone pilot with me all last week and we've taken a lot of footage and, and 360 degree images. So you can look at it like this. It's really wonderful. And uh, we've uh, taken material for a drone video as well. That's not finished yet. And even that is only the raw version. I mean, that's not published. And it's the first time I'm actually showing these pictures. I'm sharing these images. So you cannot see them yet on our website, but they will be uploaded in like a week or two. And so keep looking uh, for them. And uh, you, I will show you at the end where they are. So that's uh, uh, the ETA work site. What I'm going to do now, you see all those uh, uh, categories down below. I'm going to go through some of them. And uh, I apologize when I look to the left, but this is the first time I'm using this set of images. So I made myself a little list. Okay, so we are going first to the magnet power conversion building. Uh, buildings, actually it's two. It's these two here. Okay, they um, link, um, I have to see how I can do this here. They link, I have a, I don't know why I do this with a pad, I can do it with a mouse. Uh, they link the uh, uh, electrical grid yard through, uh, with the, the power supply through the magnet power conversion buildings and then they connect them to the magnets inside. What you see here on this side, that is the Tokamak building. That's the assembly hall where we've just been. And that's where the reactor is being built. So you see underneath the two buildings, that's where the um, the conversions are taking place. Huh? So number four, what's this one? It's an odd starting point. Uh, so this is cool though. I mean, what you see here is buzz bars. Don't know whether we have any engineers among you who understand what that means. Buzz bars are practically, I mean, this is how I explain it always. And uh, I apologize if that is a, uh, too simple in this setting. Um, I always say, if you look at your bedside lamp and you see the cable between the wall socket and your lamp, that's what the bus bars are for the magnets, okay? So you see these yellow lines here, these are the bus bars. So they are uh, pretty large, we have eight kilometers of them. And then they go up here and they will leave through this opening. Uh, and then they go on the outside and I need to see where the outside image is. I think I think it's here. Yeah, on the outside, they go through these bridges and then they go into the uh, 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 Tokamak building. So that's very fresh. Mm, these have just been built. So this is one of the uh, uh, plant buildings. The next one I'm uh, taking you to is the cryo plant. You heard me talk about the um, super cold magnets. We need to prepare this somewhere. We do that in this building here again to give you some bearings. We've just been here. Now we are going into this building. You see the tanks here. These are the helium tanks. They're already filled with gaseous helium. 
Um, and uh, in here, we are turning the helium, we are cooling down the helium. And we do that uh, first in the compressor building. And that's here. So what I always say, and uh, I've checked with my colleagues that I can say that this is basically like your fridge at home, just a lot larger. Mm. So this is where the helium is being pre-cooled down to 80 Kelvin. Uh, we are also using nitrogen to pre-cool the helium. And uh, you can see, I mean, it's absolutely packed with equipment. Uh, then it goes, in, goes into the cold box room, which is this. So the cold box, one of them, we have three, is right underneath me. And that's our drone pilot here. Uh, I'm one of the people down there getting input from our, our colleagues. You see another cold box here and another one here. And you see here what we call the cryo lines. Again, that is the conduit from the cryo plant into the Tokamak uh, building. An interesting fact uh, uh, on the site, um, uh, this is the biggest cryo plant in the world um, as, as a single building. Um, it's even bigger than anything that uh, CERN has because CERN has several cryo plants, but none of them is as big as this one. So this is a, a little record we hold here. And uh, something that is really cool that we have only recently been brought forward so much is the cryo bridges. A uh, cryo bridge is just one. And you see it here. So on the outside, here's the building. And that's the bridge. And that's the assembly hall. And here it goes into the tokamak. I mean, I can show you this images, but don't expect to see that when you come here. You will not be able to go there, but you can see these images online. Um, and then we have also a wonderful image inside the cryo bridge. So you see the two legs of it. So here, that's towards the, um, the cryo plant itself, and that's towards the tokamak. OK, let's look at the next one, um, the PF coil building. So this is where the magnets were manufactured on site. Uh, it's this long building here. It's one of the early buildings here, a contribution by Europe. Um, it's a 250 meters long. Uh, and let's have a look inside. So we go first and look at the last um, coil that has been manufactured in there. We are right inside. Look at that. This is a magnet. Okay, this is a circular magnet at a diameter of 24 meters. It looks a little bit distorted because of the, the 360 technology here, but look at this. It's already stacked, so all the elements that make up the magnet are already stacked. It's already been put in a case. It's already been treated um, uh, for insulation. And the next steps will be um, a cold test. And you can see here in the back, here, you see a, a structure that looks a little bit like the water slide in a fun park, but it's actually a mini cryostat. So we will put this coil inside here, close it. Uh, we will induce a vacuum and we will put gaseous helium at 80 Kelvin uh, into the coil to test it for its performance under cold conditions. An interesting notion is on the, on the site, this is what we've done so far with all the coils that we manufactured on site, but as part of the new baseline and as part of um, being of preparing for operation, it has also been decided to move towards full cool tests of all the coils, meaning to test them at four Kelvin, not just at 80 Kelvin, but really test them at four Kelvin to prevent any surprises at the time of operation. So this is coming as well. And I think this building will be prepared for that. So what do I have next? Um, we are going to uh, coil storage. Um, one word on the building, why we produce it here. The issue is these coils are in, in, in the finished shape. They are too big to be transported on the road. That's why the four biggest ones have been manufactured here at ITER. The two small ones, the bottom one and the top one, they were manufactured abroad and brought here. And even that was a big issue to bring them here across French country roads. I mean, that wasn't easy. Um, but these big four the four big magnets, the two 17 meter and the two 24 meter coils had to be manufactured on site because of their size. Let me show you, uh, no, this one, this one. Okay, here we are. So here you see our storage. Um, and these are the first pictures we took in there with three coils waiting to be assembled, to be put into the tokamak pit. We are inside the other 24 meter coil. That's the third one from the top, uh, the, the, the fourth one from the top. 
It's the next one to be put into the tokamak. In the back, it looks a bit small, but it's actually 17 meters. It's the second one from the top. And then you see this one here. That's the top one that has been manufactured in Russia. Uh, let me go back into um, the building. The poloidal field coil building is very large, as you could see. And we're using this now also for repair works. And uh, what we are doing in there is I mentioned to you the thermal shields. That so thermal shields, some of them are being repaired and some of them are being uh, remanufactured. So in a part of the poloidal field coil building that we don't need anymore to manufacture the magnets, we have freed up that space and we are looking into deciding which thermal shields can be repaired and which needs to be manufactured from scratch. So that's what you see here. These are parts of the thermal shield. This is what we call the the inboard thermal shield. You remember the D shape of the vacuum vessel? So these were, these thermal shields that you see on the screen, they're on the inside on the long stretch of the D. Okay, that's where they are. And what you see here in the back, I think it's the next one. Yes, down below. This is one of the panels that go on the outside, on the, on the broad side of the vacuum vessel. So let's move on to the cryostat, the thermos that I had uh, mentioned before. We get an outside view again. This is the workshop where they were manufactured. That is Little India that actually didn't belong to ITA, that belonged to the Indian manufacturer, uh, Larsen and Tubro. So that's the, um, the area of the workshop. But what I can show you is two parts of the cryostat. So what you see here, and again, that gives you an idea of scale of how huge everything is. That's the upper cylinder of the cryostat. And that, if you come on site and that is still there, which I think it will be next year, you will have the impression like uh, that a, a UFO has landed on the ETA site. That really looks like that. It looks like a flying saucer. It's a very flat item. And that's the top lid that will close up uh, the 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 thermos, the cryostat. So let's look what uh, we do also. We can have a look inside. So that's how it looks inside. You see here the giant door, this one. It does not look that giant from this angle, but I can tell you that a 30 meter, uh, a diameter component fits through that door, okay? We've put all our stuff through that door out there. So you see the big space, it's being used for other issues now. Uh, in the back, the space is uh, being used for repairs. We will see in the coming weeks and months, we will see the vacuum vessel sectors being taken there for repairs. Um, there have also been thermal shields already in here for assessment. And what you see here is a thermal shield that is actually uh, being cleaned for handover. And I have an image of that, a close up. That would be number seven here. So you see that here. So they're actually cleaning by hand. Um, that doesn't mean that there is no problem with that. I mean, I have checked with my colleagues in the hall there and they said that also has the problem with the with these uh, pipes on the outside that need to be looked at and repaired, but there's still it's, it's being prepared for the handover to ETA. Uh, and this is the colleague who told me about this. Okay, so this is the hole there. Um, let's go at another auxiliary system. That's the heat rejection. Heat rejection because, as I said, we are not producing electricity. We know how to do that. We don't need to test it. Um, we know how a power plant works. Um, so we are really evacuating the heat. So what you see here is the big um, heat rejection system, which is a, a fancy term for a cooling system. Um, there are a number of different uh, uh, things in there. It's too... We don't have the time to explain it all. Uh, suffice to say that uh, some of the items are heat exchangers, which are below us here. And it's a cool picture of the heat exchangers. I think it's this one. If you're inside. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So it's all of pipe, full of pipes here. That's the heat exchanger. So we have several closed systems between the uh, um, the applicant of the cooling water and the, the cooling system. This is three different, three closed circuits. And you see some of them here, yeah? So, and the cooling is not just for the water, for the cooling water in the walls of the vacuum vessel in the tokamak, but also for other plant systems where operationally water is being used, is heated up, it needs to be cooled down. 
Um, and then I have a last image from here that is a glance into the cooling tower, which is quite cool. So that's a cooling tower, a view inside. It's all plastic. I mean, it's a wrong term. Uh, it's a polymer, some kind of polymer, all this material here. There are five um, basins together that make up um, 12,000 cubic meters. The, the way it works here, you can't see that it's too dark, but when you research that on our website, you will see some images where you can see it better. There are fill sheets up here. It's corrugated plastic that creates a lot of tiny channels, which then creates a lot of surface. So the water runs down these surfaces and cools down just by an evaporative uh, process and ends up down below very comfortable swimming pool temperature of 27 degrees, but you will not be allowed inside. All right, so now let's go back to the assembly hall. You've seen it already, that's it from the outside. Um, one word on this reflective uh, cladding on the outside. And uh, that's maybe interesting to know. Uh, ITA has conducted a survey among the local population here to ask them, to ask people here, how would you like this building to look like? And the response was, we want it to blend into the landscape. Well, here you see the result. I mean, it's a perfect image to show that it actually works. So uh, uh, reflective cladding is used uh, to do that and all the other buildings will get it as well. Kirsten, I know you're going to show them how where to find the pictures. So I'm just almost let done. you know that yeah. Okay. Three more pictures and I'm done. Okay, I know it's so much to talk about and so much yeah. to show, but I will definitely show you how to find the pictures. Yeah. So here we are again in the assembly hall. You get the, the, the bird's eye view now. You see here the two assembly tools that we taught that we showed you. Um the up ending tool is right below us here. And here you see the beginnings of the uh, central solenoid. Okay, and we are now going across here into the tokamak, and that will be my last bit. Okay, so here's the tokamak. We are coming from there. Okay, that's the assembly hall, and this is the view into the tokamak. It looks a little. It looks like an abstract pattern. Huh? It's kind of cool. Um, the next picture will give you a bit of a better idea how it looks inside. So this is inside. So what you see here. Let me take you through it. That's our bio shield. That's a protective wall of one and a half meters against the neutron bombardment. Um, the next on the inside is here, the cryostat. That's the lower cylinder. You saw the uh, out, upper cylinder outside. This floor here belongs to the base section, which is like a soup ball. That's the rim. And that's the depression of the soup ball. You see two magnets already. Below here is uh, uh, a 10 meter poloidal field coil, so a circular horizontal magnet. And that's one of the 17 meter coils where you saw the other one in storage. That's already here. And I'm gonna show you, this is uh, my second to last picture, Dario, and then I'm done. Um, we are looking down really into the pit, down below here, the floor is the, the bottom part of the um, of the cryos that you see again here, the 17 meter coil. These are correction coils. That's another magnet system that I had not told you about. They will correct the magnetic field. In the center, here is the assembly uh, uh, tool. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is us looking at everything here and filming everything. The last picture I wanna give you is the control building which is this building here in the back. You see here a bridge which connects to a tunnel. So this is the ETA headquarters on the left here. Um, and uh, the operator scientists and engineers have the connection walkway through here. Then they will go inside and I'll just tell you, show you an image from the inside. This is it. That's what it's going to be in the future. So this is like it's going to be in the movies, I hope, and I hope I will be here to see it, you know, when they have a rocket launch and everything works well and everybody is happy clapping and crying. I hope we will see this one day in this room as well. And uh, there is a mezzanine for visitors. So this is it. Now, as you said, as you rightly said, uh, Dario, I'm going to show you where you can find it on our website. Mind you, again, at the moment, it's the old version there. You go to our homepage and now, Dario, you are, I have to move you. <laughs> you see the homepage here. You go here. That's the virtual tour. And uh, here you see the, that's the last published version from January 23. That's what happens. You'd click on that and then you get a similar image to what you've just seen. Okay. So you have the same thing. You can move around, you can go into any of these 
categories and uh, just go around, look at everything. It is actually worthwhile to go a little bit back in history to see the changes if you have the time and the interest. One thing I want you to uh, know is that you can also connect VR goggles. Even also now the Quest 2, initially we had an issue with the Quest 2, but also the Quest 2 can now be connected and you can actually view this with goggles so you can really be inside. It's really immersive. So this is where you find that. And uh, what I would like to, now that I'm here, what I would like you to see as well is our news line. Um, this is a weekly update of things happening here at ETA and uh, you can subscribe to it here. Okay, and uh, you will be updated of everything that happens here. Also, when we publish the new set of 360 degree images, when we publish the new drone video, it will be published here. Okay, I know I've probably, yes, I have overdrawn. I apologize for that. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Thank you, Kirsten. It was really nice, nice, nice presentation, nice introduction and, and showing all the all these previews of them. Really happy to see the new yes. the new pictures. So congratulations on that. Looking forward Thank to you. see them on the on Coming the website. Soon. Yes, definitely. So you have a few questions. So I guess mm -hmm. I'm gonna go through them and then I read them to you and then let's mm -hmm. see. Let's see. So one question is what is which is the volume of the vacuum room? The vacuum room. The vacuum chamber is 1400, um, but we are not going to use the entire space. As I have explained, is that the plasma volume is going to be 840 cubic meters. So you see the difference in size. And that shows you that what we are aiming for is that the plasma is not touching the walls. Because the plasma, um, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with these processes. I cannot say. I'm not even a physicist. Um, but there will be, um, there will be uh, uh, things on the edge of the plasma that are a little bit like sun flares. So there will be uh, protrusions of uh, plasma from uh, from the, the, the core plasma and uh, there needs to be enough space towards the wall so that they don't touch it. I mean there's also a lot of scientific work being done to prevent these kind of flares but uh, suffice to say the plasma volume and the vacuum vessel is different volumes in order to prevent the plasma from touching the sites. I hope that answers the question. I think that answers very well. There's also here a, a physics question. Let's see how that how is you maybe not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's see if you. Uh, so why does the why does the the neutron get the most energy and not the helium or the? That I cannot uh, explain. I, I really can... can't. Uh, you can explain it. Great. Yeah, I can just say it is because yeah, of yeah. the the difference the ma the difference of mass. So the the helium atom is heavier than the than the neutron. So neutron oh, is lighter. Is so yeah. So you know it's. Uh, the energy and mass yeah. are related at this level. So yeah, that's it's because of the mass difference that the neutron is lighter gets the most energy. So yeah. By, by the way, I had discussions with a physicist as of late because I needed to understand that the article that you see there, it's very it's very physics uh, related. Huh? And what I've learned in the process is, and that is really mind boggling again, that if the ETA plant would work as a power plant and would run 24 seven, um, this fusion reaction is so powerful, so efficient. You would only need for an entire year five kilograms of tritium and five kilograms of deuterium, 10 kilograms of fuel. Think about it for an entire year. I think this is just mind boggling. No, yeah, it's really yeah. mind boggling. Yeah. Okay. There is, there is an, a next question. Uh, I think it refers to the video you made with Sabina. So it's, mm -hmm. I, will I be able to show this amazing video to my students? <laughs> this, uh, if you want to, I think this is being recorded and you can use the recording, of course, no problem. Okay. Um, what, what I would like to ask you though, is you do, that you don't publish that. I mean, this video was really just made for you guys here and I'm not gonna even use it again. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we don't publish that on the website, but you can use it in your classes, of course you can, but don't put it on the website, thank you. Okay, yeah, no, we don't. So we were circulated then to the teachers, but then yes. we wouldn't fuse in it. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. There is a question regarding what happens if a part of the thermal shield malfunctions? Can it overheat despite the magnetic cache? Yes, of course, I think it can. That's yeah, the, the task of the thermal shield. I mean, to that's the thing what I tried to explain with the leaks. If the leaks if they if they are leaking, they will not do their 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 job as a thermal shield. They will not be cold enough um, to to cool down um, and to help the magnets manage with the heat emanating from the vacuum vessel. So whether there is a, there will be a full meltdown, I don't know whether that can happen. Dario, maybe you know that, but yeah, it would have a huge impact on everything. It will all collapse. I mean, it would not work. The fusion would not work. The plasma would collapse. All of that would not work. It will all fizzle out. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's why it's been tested extensively, and that's why, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that's why we need to pay so much attention and that's yeah. why the problems that we have encountered now are actually are in a way a blessing in disguise that we that we have found that now so that we can really take good care of that yeah that we don't encounter this kind of problem in the future hopefully yeah, yeah. So there is a question, where do we see these images later or recording of this? And I know you will send something, some links. Yeah, or some, yeah. yeah. I, will, I, um, I will put something together for you that you can use. I mean, there's so much material and I really invite you to, am I still sharing? This? Uh, is that yes, still being yeah, shared? Yeah, you are, okay. yeah, yeah, you're still sharing. Yeah. Uh, you should really go into this here. I mean, there is a photo section here and a video section here. If you go into the video section, I'm just calling it up. Um, you have four categories, okay? So what's really interesting is the drone videos, of course, what is ETA sort of general stuff, but also the machine assembly videos. Um, look through all of that. Um, there is a lot of material there. And one thing that I almost forgot, and I'm gonna send you the link. We also have, um, let me show that it's here, education, that will be interesting for you. That's our infuse. Uh, section. Where is it here on the side? I have to move you again, Dario. Infuse. Yeah. So here, this is really interesting to you, I think. Um, we have a lot of stuff here that you can use. Videos, blog posts, um, book recommendations. We even have a uh, instruction how you can build your own Tokamak with the 3D printer. We have the files available, all of that. You can do all of that. So you find all of that in this section. So I think you will have a lot of material that you can use. What we are also putting in there is a uh, material that has been produced by others. So it's not just our stuff. I mean, in fact, our stuff is the only a tiny part of all of that. We have collected things from all over. So you will have uh, a chance to use all of that. All right, great, okay. great for this. I'm gonna say last question, last two questions, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna make it into one because this is, I would say, is difficult to answer at the moment. So, oh, when timeline, will, huh? Yeah, <laughs> when no, but it's not. It, when will fusion energy will be available in our society, and how many fusion reactors will be on Earth in thirty or fifty years? So, <laughs> okay, the first question is, of course, completely speculative. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I when I listen to my own scientists, my own scientist colleagues um, talking about that at conferences, I think in the second half of the century we can expect to have industrial level functioning uh, fusion reactors but uh, whether that will be already at a level that it will be spread out all over the world i doubt it um it takes a long time for a new source of energy to actually conquer the market it took 50 years from the start of using solar powers until solar power energy is providing one percent of global supply of energy 50 years think about it so it will take some time um, what was the second part of the question, Dario? How many fusion reactors do you think will be on Earth in 30 or 50 years? That, I, mean... that, that I can't answer. Mm. Um, and a physicist couldn't answer that either. And an economist couldn't answer that either because that depends on the size of the reactor and where you put it. Um, one of the tasks in, uh, for future generations will be to see how you can actually scale a fusion reactor, how you can make it smaller, how you can make it bigger to answer to the demand in the various areas, regions of the world. You don't need a big reactor in, a, in remote areas, but you need big reactors and enough redundancy in the vicinity of cities, right? So there is a lot of um, uh, work still there um, and that can cannot really be answered at the moment. What I have heard though, just to give you an idea of, uh, a of, of what a machine like ITER could actually manage, I was told that a machine like ITER, if it was a power plant, a fusion power plant, would be able to supply the city of X completely with electricity. Okay, that's the size. Okay, so ITER is actually for the future, ITER is a small power plant, right? It's a small power plant. So already demo, which is the next generation, it's dem the demonstration power plant, which will be um, a, a fusion power plant with a power plant part attached to it. Um, that would be a lot bigger uh, again uh, uh, than ITER, but I think there are also some limits to the size of it, but that goes into technology discussions of how you manufacture the magnets. We are still using superconductive magnets at, at, at super low temperatures, but there is developments for higher temperature magnets that can then uh, can then be maybe bigger again. So there is a lot, a lot to come still. It's a very interesting field and uh, yeah, I'm um, I'm curious about it. I'm sure you are curious about it and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I okay. guess we all are. 
Kirsten, thank you very much for being here with You're us. Welcome. Thank you so much for this comprehensive presentation. Looking forward to seeing you soon in the teacher visits at ITER. So yes, again, well, yes. <laughs> yes, and hopefully some of the attendees to this event will also see you yes. live there next okay, year. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Yes, thank All you so right. much for being here. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so we have come to the, the very end of uh, our, our teacher day for today. Uh, we have a schedule of 15 minutes closing session, but trust me, we won't be, we won't take that long. I just wanted to, before we leave, I just wanted to um, to let you know a few things. Uh, so we will uh, release uh, soon an email uh, that will contain a feedback form uh, on this event for you to 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 tell us how how you felt about the, this event, and also this form will con uh, will uh, include. The possibility to have an attendance certificate so if you need an attendance certificate uh, for this event uh, please fill the form and let us know there that uh, that you will need the certificate and then we will circulate them in the in the upcoming uh, days the next week or the week after that that also comes uh, to the recordings of the sessions so we will um we will process the recordings next week and then we will uh, try to post them as soon as possible. So it's your next week or the week after that, both recordings for this session and the and the local session. And as soon as we get the additional material, for example, like Kirsten said that she will prepare uh, a, a list of materials for, for you to, to have, then we will also include that. And yeah, like I mentioned with the, with the ITER uh, visits for next year, uh, when, and during their presentation, as soon as these uh, calls are open and we are informed by DGR that this is uh, available, we will send you an email. So we will use the same uh, email list that we have when you register here, and we will send you all the information so you can so you can apply. I think that's it for the moment. I would like to thank you for your participation. I would also like to thank my team here at Fusenet for having an, an amazing event and also on the local sessions, the local organizers. Thank you so much. Uh, like we mentioned at the very beginning of the session, we uh, regard that uh, your your work is really important for, of course, for, for society in general, but in the case of Fusion, it is really important for us because you have seen the timelines of Fusion, you have seen the developments of Fusion, and we are strongly believing that the, the workforce in Fusion uh, is being trained at the moment by you, and you are those who spark the interest of the students in order to move towards Fusion and, and to achieve this, this goal that is to produce Fusion electricity for the world. So thank you so much, and stay tuned. Uh, follow us on our social media, check our webpage. And uh, like I said, if you have any initiatives locally for students for uh, organizing something with Fusion, let us know. Maybe we can find a way to work it out. And yeah, thank you much so much for being here and uh, we stay tuned. And have a good afternoon, everybody.